we wouldn't do that. Anyway. Well, I bet it's six o'clock. We'll kick it off. Can you oh, six o'clock. Are we on? Hang, hang, hang. All right, let's the meeting moving forward. This conference will for, now be recorded. Now. And then uh, let's move this along quickly. Yeah, let's get started. Thank you, Mr. Chair. You've got the um, agenda in front of you. Uh, if you could just read the declaration, or would you prefer me to do it? Go ahead. Okay, due to the nature of the declaration of a state of emergency due to the novel coronavirus COVID 19, pursuant to code 2.2 3708 2, this meeting is to be held by electronic communications via the web platform GoDoMeeting. The catastrophic nature of this declared emergency makes it impractical and unsafe to assemble a quorum in a single location. And the purpose of this meeting is to discuss or transact the business statute, statutory required or necessary to continue operations of the public body. A video recording of the meeting will be posted to the FAMPA Policy Committee page, webpage. Okay. Do we have a uh, Call the meeting to order. Well, let me make sure it's a quorum. I know. Do we have a quorum? This is we have more than a quorum, but the um, roll call will be done by Mr. Stacey Fines. Mr. Chair, if we could ask her to do the roll call and then she'll uh, check the attendance. Stacey, if you could do that. Yes, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. All right, great. Um, from Stafford County, Miss Cindy Shelton. On her way. Mark Dudenheffer. Here. Crystal Vanuch. Here. Meg Baumke. Here. Thomas Cohen. From Spotsylvania County, Tim McLaughlin. Here. Chris Yakabowski. Here. David Ross. Here. Kevin Marshall. Deborah Frazier. Gary Skinner from the city of Fredericksburg, Matthew Kelly. Here. Jason Graham. Here. Tim Baruti. Here. Doug Fawcett. Mark Whitley. From King George County, Kathy Binder. Here. Ann Kupka. Here. From Caroline County, Jeffrey Seeley. Jeffrey Black. From FTA, Tanya Holland. From Federal Highway, Richard Duran. From Fred Transit, Jamie Jackson. Here. Aiden Quirk. From PRTC, Bob Schneider. Joe Stainsby. Present. Betsy Massey. A representative from the Secretary of Transportation, Marcy Parker. Here. Michelle Shropshire. From VDOT, Susan Gardner. Here. Stephen Haynes. Here. From DRPT, Todd Horsley. Sierra Williams. From the Citizens Transportation Advisory Committee, David McLaughlin. Here. Al Durante. And from the CTB, Cedric Rucker. We do have a quorum present. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay. Next item, approval of the May 20 policy agenda. Second. Second. <laughs> we have motion in a second. Do we have a comment? Yeah, uh, I would like to table until our next meeting, item nine hotel. 
to our staff to uh, get more input on that. And get more input on that. Which one of us? Just approval of the minutes, right? No, oh, I'm sorry. No, the agenda. Nine. Nine hotel. H. Nine H. The schema. To defer until. Yeah, and my understanding is deferring will not uh, impact anything. See if you correct me on that. Uh, so, Mr. Chair, there are um, in the presentation two items <laughs> that are small amounts of money which we do need to approve today, and we'll show you that in, in the presentation. The one is for $34,000, the other one is for about $86,000. Both of those items are time sensitive because it's money that is left over from close out of. Projects that are not complete. What item is that? It's item 9H, H for hotel, the CMAC allocation. No, I think he's saying there's some item in, inside of that for you. So there are two items inside of that which are small amounts of money, but which, if we don't approve them before the 1st of June, because they're little bits left over from prior projects, we'll so lose them. So why do we, it sounds like it's a rollover. Is that what it is? It's money which will not be rolled over. It's money which we must allocate to another project. Otherwise, we'll lose it because it's not new money. It's very old money. With, and it's small amounts. It's not large amounts. So you can request a table all the stuff that's too late. Okay, I'll do that. It's, it's the CMAC. Just for everybody's um, awareness, it's the CMAC allocations which the TAC recommended but not unanimously. Mm -hmm. So that's the item that's we'll talking about. <clears throat> Let's go. Well, why don't we just have the discussion if after the discussion well i think at least frankly we could table it at that point because mm -hmm. we got to bring up these issues anyway well you know these two issues we've discussed but as, as you mentioned in the last meeting is you're bringing something to our attention for the first time for the first time to discuss and that was one of your big complaints the last meeting we just had so we have the same issue right here where it's been requested because there were some changes to the process or the how it was allocated or whatever the uh the questions came well, up. we can talk about that during the oh, right. oh, <clears throat> that's the question that mr ross wants to take with there are two items within that H that need to be voted on because of a specific issue. Let's pull those two items specifically out and table the rest. And that's just okay. I would at least like to have here from staff and why <clears throat> what the changes were because my understanding is we all agree to a process for the CMAC allocation. And this is basically going back on something we well, all agreed on already. Mr. Kelly, that's exactly right. I understand that the process wasn't followed to what the order was. So that's why there needs to be a discussion. And we need to have time to look at it. That's why it was too critical. The nine age is not critical. Those two specific ones, and again, as of today, this is the first we heard from two items are critical. Okay. So that's a little frustrating, but there's a motion or there's a request, I guess you're making a substitute motion. Yeah, I, I well, yeah, you're asking the table. Just table everything except the two items that he had said the time sensitive, the thirty-four thousand and eighty-six thousand. I I believe that the vote was all six reps from Stafford and and uh, spots may voted against this coming forward. So the, on the, on the are you talking about the attack? Yeah, on the attack. So at the attack only uh, spots may voted against. Oh, that was it. Okay. So all, all other jurisdictions and the state reps voted in favor. Well, I point, kind of a point of order. I, I, I don't think I've ever heard of pulling an item off the agenda from the start. I mean, especially if it's something that should be heard in the pieces of it. Why wouldn't we get to it and then have have the debate and then table the, the vote and the, a resolution? Sure. I would all withdraw it and we can do that because it's not like I mess anyway. I was just no, I, I'm not necessarily just trying to say David. I just think about a long time. So what we want to bring up, the obviously there's some discussions issues within the county, our responsibility and county staff in this process. And for it to be brought up and voted on today. I'm not saying we should vote on it. I just think we keep it. And as Mr. Kelly said as well, it's a good opportunity to discuss it. And we'll hope that you will help us take a look over those two items. Is tabling the right word? I'm not sure. Defer. Table is not. Table is not. So I think your point might not be different than us, but we can table things. Okay. Robert's rule of order. Yeah, Robert's rules of order. Then we would have to remove it from the table and it wouldn't necessarily be on the agenda. So we just operate yeah. differently. I think we're on a Roberts too, but for 10 years. All right. So the next meeting. with that, we have a we have a motion and a second. Mr. Chair, the only other item is because the chairperson is going to be late. Um, her um, chair comments, if we could defer those to whenever she 
is, is yeah, other than that, the agenda oh. was quite fine. <laughs> All right, all good. Any more discussion? Who said the main motion? You did. I think you did. What, this one? The no, 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 it's not. The main motion is on the board. We're going to go to it and then we'll let's see. Okay. We're going to discuss that. All right, that's fine. Okay. Any other discussion? All right, hearing none, call the question. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Anyone Aye. opposed, announce yourself online. Aye. Who is that? Meg. I think that was Meg. So Meg is opposed? But... No, I said Anybody I voted opposed? in favor. Correct. Does anybody oppose the motion? Hearing none, the motion passed. All right. Public involvement. Stacy, are you aware of anything that has come in subsequent to our discussion? Um, we we do not have any comments to read for the public involvement for the next item, public hearing. We will. Um, and I just asked the chair to check to see if we have anyone on the line who would like to give a verbal comment. We're on full. We'll get to that. We're on full, right? Is there any public involvement? Anybody online? Speak. Hearing none, we'll move. We'll move on. on the public hearing. These are the public hearings, Mr. Chair, for the draft 2045 LRTP amendment, the uh, unified, the UPWP 22, the uh, transportation improvement program amendment, and the draft community engagement equity <coughs> plan. If there's any public comment at this time, and Stacey, did you say there were comments received? Yes, I have two comments to uh, read to you. Before you read, are we taking, is this one public hearing for all? We're doing a public hearing jointly for these four items. Or four items. So okay. save yourself some time by putting them all together tonight. People are knocking down the door. So for that, I guess we'll open the public hearing at this point. Are there any comments? Stacy, if you could read the written comments to see. Sure. From Andrew Coleman, a resident of the city of Fredericksburg, he would like to voice his support for the following proposed amendments included in the 2045 LRTP for Lafayette Boulevard improvements and widening for Tidewater Trail widening. And he writes that I currently live in the Browns neighborhood on Lafayette Boulevard and getting in and out can be difficult depending on the time of day due to traffic congestion. It's also not safe for pedestrians if they wish to walk or bike along that route. Please consider making this project a priority moving forward. I also frequent Tidewater Trail, which also suffers from traffic congestion on a daily basis. That's from Andrew Coleman, resident of the city of Fredericksburg, regarding the LRTP amendments. Regarding the TIP amendment, we have one public comment received from Jennifer Faulkner of Healthy Generations. She writes, we support the inclusion of the Rob Hannock Area Community Services Board transportation project in the local TIP and are proud to partner with an organization that does so much for our community. Thanks to Clark for, for providing a great overview of the transportation needs of individuals involved in the Rob Hannock Area Community Service Board program on the FAMPO Facebook live stream today. And again, that's in support for the TIP amendment, specifically the Rob Hannock Area Community Services Board paratransit project. That concludes the comments we've received. Are there any comments from anyone online? Hearing none, we'll close the public comment period. Is there any discussion on the project? Uh, the discussion will be held later on as they come up in the agenda. No need to discuss them now. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah, I'll, move the yeah. I'll move the consent agenda. Do we have a, uh, mo a motion to approve? Is there a second on the consent agenda? Second. Any opposed? All right. It was the any comment? Second. I was. Ms. Van Nuys is the second. Thank you. Is there any comment or questions on the consent agenda? Okay, all those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed state your name that you're opposed. Any abstentions state your name that you abstain. Meg Bomke, I'm abstaining. I was not in attendance at the meeting. Is there anyone else? Okay. 
both in here. Uh, we'll, uh, we'll defer the chair comments. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I, report. Um, I would just request um, members if you could hold your comments to the end because I want to try and get through the slides quickly. Feel free to ask any comments at the end. They're, they're not a huge, a long presentation. Okay, thank you. Next slide. Next slide. Next one. There we go. In your pack today, there's a letter uh, to do with the CTB spring uh, consultations talking about the I 95 specifically between Route 130 and 126. If implemented, this will deal with the concern that I've heard from many members about the uh, bottleneck that may occur once all the other upgrades are done slightly further down the road. Uh, the chairperson has already made those comments at the CTP, uh, the Pivalenia, the PAC, just to reaffirm that already. So I don't require a program ever, and this is just a point from my point of view. Um, it represents an economic and security risk for the state. And what I mean by that is that we, we need viable alternative routes should the I-95 become blocked. We're spending a lot of time upgrading the I-95 and that's the right thing to do. However, let's not forget that every time the I-95 blocks, the alternatives not being good alternatives are exposed. And I think we need to think about that. So examples of things that we should do Take the rail upgrade seriously, increase the commuter bus program like Omniride, reduce traffic lights on Route 1. That's one of the things that is a problem because you shut the traffic off the I-95, Route 1 can't handle it. it, it is too many stop and go, stop and go situations. Identify roads which can be upgraded in future and continue to develop van pooling, car pooling, slugging. We need to support all of these things, particularly looking for alternatives to the I-95 because when it blocks, when there's a fire, a truck smashes, and there's a chemical fire, you wreck the economy for days. Uh, it, it's, it's a risk we should be aware of. Next. So the CTB, um, the six year improvement program, was published at their recent meeting. Travel was allocated the $59,100 in grant funding towards the East West Mobility Study. This is only for transit. We're not allowed to use it for anything other than transit. But we're grateful for uh, that um, allocation in the SIP. It really helps us with the study. Uh, the chairperson, as I said, made those comments at the CTB about the I-95. Mm -hmm. um, I follow up with the letter and the draft letters in your pack, and we'd like to follow this up again in the fall at the CTB just to make sure that they realize that we're quite serious about this. This board, this policy committee did vote to ask for those things and have consultation with the secretary for consultation before my time. So what I'm doing is just re-emphasizing what you've already decided in the past. Next slide. Freight. You remember last time we spoke about these critical freight corridors that the state had decided to delineate and no new corridors were delineated in our area. There's a reason for that. They, one of the rules that they have to follow is the order of magnitude comparison by tonnage. And we're keen to have things like Route 1 and Route 17 um, chosen as critical freight corridors. But because of that tonnage requirement, Route 1 and Route 17 fall to the very bottom of the pile. And they can only allocate a certain number of miles per state to be identified as critical freight corridors. So because of that, Route 1 and Route 17, as examples, among others, <coughs> have not been identified as critical freight corridors. Next slide. However, we're aware from extensive research that freight traffic movements in the Tampa and Fredericksburg region have some of the worst travel time and congestion metrics in the state. And in some cases, the, the, the delays of freight is the worst in the nation. So federal law, such as the FAST Act, um, focuses primarily on highway tonnage and other metrics, but not specifically travel time metrics and delays. Point we have asked whether we have any objection to the listing of that list that I showed you last month of critical freight corridors. We don't propose objecting for the simple reason that OIP is implementing the rules correctly. So OIP is not making any mistakes. We extensively dug into this. I spoke to Ivan Rucker, I spoke to people at in Richmond and look through the thing. They're following the rules, so we don't feel that we should be objecting. However, my last point, I would suggest that the legislation itself needs a review. 
because it doesn't look into travel time delays and it doesn't look at roadways other than interstate roadways specifically. And I think that's a limitation in the law, not in the implementation. So my advice is we don't object to what um, OIP is doing because they're following the rules, right? They're not breaking any rules. There's nothing you can see that they're doing wrong. But we should in future be looking at getting our, our, our federal delegates and state delegates to review this law. It has some weaknesses in it. Next slide. So the East West study, just a quick uh, reminder of what we're doing. Phase one, we're looking at multimodal transit, TDM, and related improvements, bike and pedestrian links to transit studies. Phase two, we'll look at roadways, bike and pedestrian improvements to increase East West mobility. And this will include detailed route alignment and right of way engineering for all modes. Next slide. We're starting on the 1st of July. That's when the grant for the first phase becomes available, uh, assuming that we get the final approval by CTB of their six year improvement program. We're looking at the first stakeholder meeting around the 1st of August. And you know, we're going to look at the current. Red routes, Omni ride routes, VRE routes, land pool connections, plus new possibilities. Next slide. Phase two will start um, perhaps six months later, subject to funding, if you agree to the funding amount that's in the pack, because we will need funding or some other form of funding to do phase two, because phase two is roadways, and we can't use GRPT money for roadways, it's illegal. Um, we'll use the same stakeholder group. Some issues are obvious, such as congestion on those key roadways. We're going to look at those, and we're going to look at recommendations followed by right of way engineering where applicable for all modes. Next slide. Both phases aim to study and aim to produce recommendations which can be included in future smart scale applications and updates to the LRTP. The recommendations should lead to funding applications and recommendations to state partners and local jurisdictions. Just a reminder, DRPT and 5307 funds can only be used for transit. We can't use that money for roadways. The proposed PIP funding, which is in your pack, uh, would cover roadways, bike portion, and the right of way engineering. Next slide. The same sort of stuff. Um, the presentations in the pack, there's some concerning implications, which we'll share with you. We've done more work since our last meeting on this. There's a Possibility of a severing of the urban area connection between Stafford and the Washington DC user day, depending on what implementation the Census Bureau does, right? And you'll see that in the presentation. This, together with potential increased funding possibilities, should give Pampo a reason enough to begin at least to think about the possibility of a Pampo TLA instead of being attached to the DC TLA. Now, that's something for you just to think about. I'm not telling you well, if there is a danger of us losing the connection to the TMA with DC, we will lose funding. Next slide. And see that in the late presentation. The next slide I'm going to go through very quickly just to update you on what's happening across the border next door at Quantico. The proposal to extend the metro line from DC all the way to Quantico or somewhere around there. These are the possibilities they're looking at. Next slide. Next slide. Okay. Uh, just one back, please. Uh, go back to the yellow line there. So, the yellow line mm -hmm. to Tomek Mills, that's one possibility extending the metro line. Two, next one. The blue line possibility, next one. And that's a BRT alternative, bus traffic transit instead of the metro line. Next one. That is using the existing BRE, but just putting much more in terms of the number of trains and headways and all that kind of that stuff to increase the amount of traffic on the BRE line. That's another alternative they're looking at. Next one. And this is using express buses instead of all of those things as another alternative. Next one. That's the guy that has been giving us um, just information on what is happening there. And if you want to comment or want further information, it's in your pack. So any, any one of our jurisdictions can email or ask for further information. Next slide. Way forward. The CMAC RSPD budget were reduced initially, remember, by 2.7 million. And then recent updates increased the amounts 
and again. So we've got PIP funding, we've got other funding, which you'll see in the back. The RFP, we haven't delayed. Um, VDOT came to us and said they need to send our uh, RFP to Richmond for the DBE um, disadvantaged and so on enterprises uh to examine our, our RFP. They came back and said we're going to have a 12% DBE quota. Um, I'm, forgive my language, I'm not familiar as much with the legislation language as, as what you are. Um, and so that led to a delay. So we're now meeting with them next week to just discuss how exactly we should couch that in our RFP. And we're going to release the ish the RFP on the 1st of June. So it's a month later than we planned, but I just wanted you to know why the delay. It's because we were requested to put the RFP through that DBE process. We have prepared a broad mobility and accessibility survey, which is gonna go with the, the LRTP and the East West Mobility Study to ask the public again, where does the transportation system not work for you? What routes don't work for you? Where are destinations you wanna to get to that you can't get to, et cetera? We're searching for funding for a future freight study. I'm not, not doing that with any uh, enthusiasm right now because we've got a lot going on, but we are looking. We continue to work with Swiss Bain, Fredericksburg on salvaging as much of the DCR right away as we can. And future proposals are not just for into development zones or something that I think we should think about in the future. Thank you very much. Is that the last slide? Yeah, that's the last one, Ian. Great. So, Madam Chair, um, slides are done. I'll take any questions. I'll try to do them very quickly. Thank you, Madam Chair. So uh, I agree. I, first of all, I love your Batman cufflinks. <laughs> I saw those also. <laughs> mm, they're pretty awesome. Can you guys hear me uh, on the uh, conference call? I know Tim's talking pretty loud, but I was just wondering if I'm readable or not. I'll get closer to the mic if I'm not. Coming through loud and clear. Loud and clear? Okay, great. So. I have quite a few years, although not the last, of commuting up and down I-95, and I couldn't agree with you more, saying that when I-95 stops, everything stops. It, it just backs up 610 in Stafford. It backs up Route 3. It backs out back up Route 1. Everything comes to a stop. And we've had chemical uh, spills right before the bridge, right? I don't necessarily agree with more commuters or like buses and, and, and that only because somebody's going to be sitting on a bus in that situation on 95 in the parking lot, right? And maybe you can improve the roads, Route 1, Route 3, 610, but it would take a heck of a lot of money to do. And just from that 20 years of experience in commuting, what we're short on here without a study is river crossings, right? We're short on river crossings. That's the block. It's been that way since the Civil War. It's still the case today. You know, we've tried, Spotsylvania County has tried this back in 2013 and I've all but given up on it, right? So uh, I'll just throw that out there with the outer connector, different outer connectors, like east, west, whatever we have. Uh, without a study, we need river crossings or we're not gonna, we're gonna just go into that same parking lot. So it's certainly something we can look at in our future studies. All right, well, thank you. That's all I've got. Yeah. Mr. I'll follow up on that and one other thing. Uh, last week, no, earlier this week, top five, I sat in on a tabletop regional exercise on a scenario with a tractor trailer sliming into the bridge on 95, number of fatalities. And I would first off, I want to thank everybody's staff did a great job and what their roles would be and how they would fill in and how they would each respond to this and did a great job identifying all the problems that are out there that we have to face in a situation like that but we're really 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 short on solutions things of capabilities and everything else like that to deal with something at that massive scale so frankly anything we can do that could actually pre-plan a little bit with regards to roots out of whatever the option is it's something we really need to look at which results in a question i had for uh, marcy uh, not a year or so ago when we started looking at this this uh, work being done on 95, the state recognized that they had to look for alternatives to get around 95 when things happen. And specifically with regards to construction, they were looking at making improvements on 301 corridor and being able to use that as a diversion of traffic, basically up to 60 points out of four. Well, I just want to know if what has been done moving that initiative forward. 
So we had completed the 301 corridor study. Uh, King George and Caroline counties had both requested uh, different projects through the smart scale. Um, some of them did get approved in the last round of smart scale and you're putting me on the spot and I don't remember which ones they were off the top of my head. Uh, but there are at least three or four projects, I believe, along the 301 corridor that were approved in the last round of smart scale. So there's still a few years away from construction. Hey, it's Annie here. I can tell you which ones uh, they were if y'all want some help. Sure. Sure we can get that information for you. I just I was wanting to see how far we're along. That's pretty important. That's why I keep saying it's a very important quarter for us. Something happens. I'll jump up to the other one. Uh, I've been involved in the discussions at both VRE and PRTC on the mobility study from Springfield to Quantico. And I do want to say I've asked on a number of occasions when most of the people that are actually going to be using all that are coming from the FAMPO jurisdictions why aren't we a little bit more involved in that conversation than we are? Uh, but it's I think because it's, it, it is strictly a political game. It's, for, it's for, not, I've been dealing with this for 15 years. Every single candidate person who runs in Prince William County and parts of Fairfax as part of their platform for 15 or 20 years says Metro to uh, Potomac Mills or Metro to, Car um, to Prince William. Never Metro further south. Now, we're not included in any of that. Well, the reason I brought it up, and I don't know if the policy board wants to go down this road, but to your point, it is an opportunity for us, while we're not directly involved in it, that we can take a policy decision and say, these are the options we would prefer to look at. Because frankly, if we were to look at a metro option, the amount of money that's going to cost, how much money it's going to incur, could be potentially an issue with us. And maybe look at so BRE expansion. That makes sense for us too, because we're running most of the trains out of our areas on the west. So I don't know that at some point the staff or the policy committee wants to make a specific recommendation, as we are basically a big stakeholder in that planning, because it's we are people from those cases moving, that we might want to say something official as FAMPO on our recommendations on that study. Just get it on right. How many times? I got been in this discussion and it's it's almost laughable. And you, you know, now need to do all the can all the, the, the representatives up and down any of those proposed lines are now delegates, democratic delegates in the, in the House and the Senate. And this is their they just say it. They, you know, they I think we've already done a study on this back 12, 14 years ago. And it was a it was a I think just off the cuff, it was like a $10 billion project back 10 years ago. So it's probably a $20 billion project now. So it's, it's strict, and it put, the, the worst part of it is you put it out here and it they discussed it and they talked about a study and a whole bunch of people think, oh man, I, this guy's done a great job and there isn't the money to go anywhere. And if you notice, the corridor they want to go down is strictly housing. There are communities, there's very little industry or commercial traffic along there. If you look at the, the route that went out toward Leesburg and you look at all the international and national headquarters and whatever all along that route, you'll see a major difference in how they'll look at the, the uh, how, you know, the, the study. The study will take what? How long did they say the study would be? Year or two? I think it takes a year. They're, they're currently busy with it, and I think it wraps up. I can't remember the exact completion date. Um, I don't have a computer. I guarantee you it's, it's aligned with one of the elections. That's a year. I'm gonna... That's a year. Yeah. I just, it would just be... I, 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 forgive me. I'm just. No, I, I, I share your frustration because as sitting in these meetings, it is interesting that we keep hearing about MBTC and we hear about PRTC, but nobody at the table up there really. But we have to raise our hands and go, uh, excuse me, there's some sort of jurisdictions, which frankly, over the next 10 or 15 years, when it comes to population growth and everything else like that, are going to become much bigger players in this whole corridor than even our Northern Virginia friends. So it's, I'd like this if we could take the opportunity to say BAMPO, which is a big chunk, 
has a position on this, and this is what our position is. Understanding it's a potential speed bump, but if we don't say anything, then we just continue down this road and they do exactly what you're saying. At least they have to take a moment to think about it. It's worth it. Well, I mean, if we were our own what, TMA. You know, TMA, I mean, we would have more clout, at least than what we were saying. I mean, they would have to pay attention. So any idea when we might that's going to fall out? The we're going to show you the sense of stuff right now, and it does not look like it's going to get better for us just looking at the proposals they had for changing the way they calculate urban areas. Um, the, the, the back door or the B route is to approach the governor and say, we request, ever request the governor to declare a teammate here, because if the governor declares that there's no numerical requirement, it doesn't matter how many people there are, but it's at the discretion of <coughs> the policy committee and the governor. <coughs> And if the governor and the policy committee agree, a letter goes to the secretary for transportation, and the rule says that he must then declare it a a transportation management area. Hmm. So it's it's up to the local MPO and the governor to agree or not agree on the issue, and then to send letters to the secretary for transportation. That's that. Those are the two ways. You either reach two hundred thousand people in your urban area, or you. Uh, uh, make a decision to, to, to have a TMA and then you approach the governor to give you a letter of support that goes to the Secretary for Transportation. He pretty much doesn't have much say, the Secretary for Transportation federally, pretty much doesn't have a lot of say. It's, it's, he has to implement if there's 200,000 people he has to, or if the governor and the MPO request it, he basically has to as well. There's very little leeway on, on the Secretary, those other two approaches. But we can find out more information if the, if the policy committee. Well, I mean, in the relationship between TMA and Josh Cole's big plan for a, you know, a, what is it? Transportation, Transportation authority. authority. How are all those things connected? I, I don't know. I've been involved in this. Well, the long time. Authority discussion yet. Well, for sure. my, my point is, is that we shouldn't deal with any requests or whatever in fact without seeing how all of that connects, if it connects. Maybe, but I mean, look at the conglomeration of crap you have up in the, the north. It, it's hard to tell who's in charge of what, who plans for what, who's in charge. I, you know, I'm always confused up there um, with that. So if we're going to do something like you're talking about, I think we need to methodically look at how potential pieces are and whether we want to do them. Well, I would say after the presentation, you might want to access at least direct staff to bring that information back for us to look at. Agree. Like a report? Yeah. We can do a report. I, want to get, I think everybody can see what it is and then we can. Okay. Yeah. We we'll said that to the agenda next week. I'll do that. Thank you. Thank you. That's it for me, by the way. Thank you, Mr. I, I have number two. Here, not saying, <laughs> not saying, <laughs> It's got to be somewhere. That's great. All right, what uh, are we on now? We are on. Are you finished, Mr. I'm finished. Thank, Thank you, sir. Thank you for your report. Item number nine in our action discussion items. First item up is a very little speed limit presentation. It's not too far, mm -hmm. take it away. All right. Thank you, Madam Chair. Members of the board. Uh, in the last two FAMPO meetings, I had mentioned that I-95 would be getting variable speed limits between milepost 115 and milepost 130 northbound on 95. At the April CTB meeting, there was an in-depth presentation, and tonight I'm going to go through an abbreviated version of that presentation uh, to bring you up to date. Uh, the full version is on our website as well as at the CTB meeting if you wanted to watch that at some point in the future. Uh, next slide, please. <coughs> So many of you remember that VDOT had performed a corridor study of all of I-95 in Virginia from Washington or Maryland all the way down to North Carolina back in 2019. And we'd had numerous public meetings during that time frame. Recommendations from that study were presented to the CTB in January of 2020. And <clears throat> excuse me, at that time, the CTB did approve the operational improvements that were recommended in the study, but they did hold off on the capital improvements in order for VDOT to conduct a similar study on I-64. And that study is almost finalized. 
So this project was one of the recommended operational improvements from the I-95 corridor plan. And some reasons that this project was chosen uh, were the recurring and the non-recurring congestion. So anyone who lives around here knows that that area backs up frequently, especially on the weekends. And this section also has a higher crash rate and those crashes do cause significant delays. Next slide, please. So this slide shows the annual person hours of delay. And you can see that the hours start rising just north, uh, on northbound, just as you start to approach exit 118, which is Thornburg, and that's the green line is northbound. The red line is southbound. Uh, so the hours of delay, they steadily increase as you approach the Rappahannock River. And on the next slide, we talk a little bit about the collision types. So looking at the collision types in this area, you can see that the majority are rear end collisions. And this is not uh, shocking. Uh, and this is mostly due to the speed differential that exists out there and of course, bad driving habits. So speeds ahead slow down quickly and the people that are following too close or not paying attention tend to rear end the vehicle in front of them. There's also a, a high rate, 19% of fixed object off the road accidents. And this falls in line with the same type of thing that speeds are slowing very quickly. And then the people try to avoid hitting the vehicle in front of them, thus swerving off the road and hitting guardrail, trees, poles, signs, a variety of things. Next slide. So this slide shows the number of days that the speed is reduced along the corridor. And it appears that it went from January of 2019 through August of 2020. And as you can surmise, green is good, red is bad. Uh, in the boxed out area on the right hand side, you can see that for 110 days in that time period, the speed was five to 15 miles an hour below the speed limit. And for 68 days of that time period, it was 35 to 45 miles below the speed limit. And the speed limit in that section, the majority of the speed limit is 70. It does run uh, drop down to 65 around uh, exit 126. So the theory behind variable speed limits is to slow the traffic earlier to avoid the big bottleneck. Think of it as pouring rice through a funnel. If you just dump all the rice in the funnel, it takes a long time for that rice to get through. But if you slowly pour the rice into the funnel, it passes through easily. Next slide. So, what is it going to look like? What are you gonna see out there? Uh, you will see about, there'll be about six additional cameras surveillance cameras, which is kind of in the middle of the screen that will monitor the traffic. And then the actual variable speed limit signs, you can kind of see there's one on each side and that'll be a static, a white and black static sign. And the only thing that'll change on it, the variable part will be the number. So these are similar to the signs near the Hampton Roads Bridge Tunnel, if, if you ever traveled down that way. And then of course there's a flashing light, a flashing beacon on top of those signs dash when the speed is less than either 65 or 70, whichever is the normal posted speed in that area. So there'll be about 24 of those signs, one on the right, one on the left in about 12 different locations. And then there'll also be radar detector device on a pole, which is also over on the right hand side. And that's going to be collecting the data that's needed to determine what the speed is. So on the next slide, we'll kind of show you a little bit about that. So if you follow along, number one in the top middle, um, that radar device, it collects the speed and the volume and some occupancy data, and it sends it over to the control algorithm. And then a whole bunch of math and stuff I don't understand uh, is put together and it derives what the posted speed limit should be. And then it sends that speed limit out to the road and it puts this posted speed limit up. And it can do this, so it's collecting this data every 30 seconds but we will not change the speed limit less than every 60 seconds. And it, it won't be that often, you know, uh, it'll, it'll be a, a lot longer than that, I'm sure. Um, so on the next slide, it talks about the project timeline. 
And you know we're we're well into this project. The algorithm is in development. Um, we're in design right now for the, where the signs are going to go and the utilities. You know we need power and we need um, internet and things like that uh, to these locations. So all of that is in design, and then it will quickly go into um, construction in the near future, and then the it'll become operational in the fall of 2021. Now. We have developed a public engagement plan, and on the next slide, it talks a little bit about that. And we're still developing what we're gonna do. So the messaging that we're gonna go out to the public with is really twofold. It's about increasing awareness of what variable speed limits are, and it's also gonna talk about the safety. It's gonna be heavy into the safety on why we need to do this. So we've got three waves kind of of timing. We did the CTV presentation last month, and that was the first wave. When we're ready to turn on the system, there'll be a whole launch uh, type of communications plan. And then we feel that each season or each summer season, we're gonna need to do some sort of education uh, because every year we get people coming through the 95 corridor that only come through here once or twice a year when they're on their way to vacation. So we're, we're looking at you know reaching out to other states as well as other areas and like AAA Magazine as an example, things like that to explain what this is. And so we'll try to do some sort of outreach each year. Um, we have a lot of detailed information on our website at that web address. There's a frequently asked questions, there's a VO, uh, there's the presentation that was given at the CTB meeting last month. Um, and then some of the strategies we're using state police on this, of course, because you know they are the enforcement arm of the Commonwealth, and they will jointly project with us. And we will launch like social media, we'll you know buy some media, we'll use whatever we have, and then uh, we'll probably have some sort of event at the I-95 rest areas, along with have a lot of information posted there as, as uh, driver stop. We hope that that'll hit a lot of maybe the out-of-state folks who need to rest before they, they start to go up, because they may know that there's a lot of traffic on 95 as you head north. Um, some other things we're doing, we will be briefing the local government and the local law enforcement before we activate this. Uh, and we want to make sure that we're communicating uh, the change early with the private mapping partners. So we want to talk to Waze and Google and things like that to make sure that they understand what's going on and, and you know what they do with that information. That is up to them. But we want to make sure that they understand uh, the information that they may be getting. So the next slide is just the, the YouTube video link to watch the video um, that explains all this much better than I did. Uh, and it even has a, a little little video showing the rice going through the funnel, which is pretty cute. Um, and then the next slide just is for questions. So if anybody has any questions, I will do my best to answer them. Okay. Mr. Kelly, um, it sounds like this is already up and running going forward, but I just said, is there anything out there on best practices where this has been done before that we can look at and see how it's actually worked or is this something that we are kind of taking on on our own so we vdot has uh, a couple different ones that they are not based on speed though so we on i-77 we have variable speed limits uh for fog um so that's really weather related as the fog starts to come there's a huge bridge on i-77 i'm not sure exactly what it goes over uh, I've only been on it a few times, but it, it a lot of fog comes in there, so they reduce the speed limit, uh, and that's more for a safety thing. We do have variable speed limits also at the Hampton Roads Bridge Tunnel, um, and that is really, you know, when you're slowing the people down because you're, you're clearing something from the tunnel. It's similar to that. We did reach out. There are other states in the country that use this. Uh, Colorado is big with it. I know we've talked to them a lot. Um, I forget what other states are using it right now, but we have spoken with those states. We have gotten a lot of advice on both how the system works, what works well, what doesn't work well, as well as their communication plan on how do they alert people of what's going on. One thing I did leave out is that at every exit, an entrance ramp or entrance ramp really, which is really only Thornburg, Massaponics, um, and I think it wraps up right before 1.30 gets on, there will be message boards that are posted that will say if, there, if the variable speed limit is in effect or not. Um, so it's not like you're going to get on and you're going to be like, oh my God, what's the speed limit? And plus with you know 24 signs, you should see it in the corridor. Uh, but we will have notification 
on the ramps to let people know uh, that the variable speed limits are in effect. Thank you. Thank you, mm -hmm. Mr. Yeah, so I had the same question as Matt. So is there, there's no white papers or anything from another state. I mean, I question the effectiveness of this. I'm from a small town in Iowa. Used to obey the speed limit there. And I remember in 1988 when I went to the basic school at Quantico, how going with the flow of traffic, I looked down and my second lieutenant will bill, and I'm going 80 miles per hour because I'm going with the flow of traffic, right? And it seems like traffic here is, it goes with the flow of the traffic. So I hope we're not spending a whole bunch of money on something. And you're right, enforcement is key. But how much enforcement do we see on I 95 today? <laughs> When people are doing 80 on I-95 today or 70 or whatever, you don't see it. If the whole, if everybody's going that speed, they're not pulling everybody over. So I, have you looked at that? Have you looked at, here, here's what it's going to take. Here's how many cars are going to have to get pulled over to have them actually obey these speed limits. Or do you think they're just going to be ignored? Because I, I personally think they'll be ignored and the traffic flow will be what the traffic flow is. So I, I don't know if there's a white paper here in Virginia, but yes, there's there's lots of research that's been done on this. Like I said, we in other states as well as uh, the research that we had done that does show that this does work. And you know, this is this is not a pilot, but this is this is the only place we're putting it because we feel that this where seems, has it worked? Where, where has it worked where we can see something that's before it was put in effect and after, and, and what the effect was. Um, Colorado, like I said, Colorado, like I said, has used it for, um, I want to say over 10 years yeah, now. Yeah, I'm sorry. Let me make it clear. I'm not talking about using it. I'm talking about the effectiveness of it. Well, I don't know if they have an effectiveness like document. Um, but Wait, I don't think they would use it if, if it wasn't. Somebody knows if it works or not. It's just some model. Well, Colorado wouldn't keep it for 10 years. I would hope he would have something like, yeah, you know what, this is actually effective. Not that it's just been in use. Do you have something like that from anywhere? I'm sure that our traffic engineering section does. Um, but again, Colorado wouldn't use it for 10 years if it wasn't effective. Well, that's not true. We have speed limits that go down to 55 when you get into D.C. right now. And whether they're effective or not, I would say is, is they're not. You know, when you drive into DC from here, the speed limit cuts from 65 to 55, that part is still going 70. So I would say that's not effective. And we've been doing that for 30 years or longer. So I would disagree with you there. Just because you've been doing it doesn't mean it's effective. That's a good question. Jen, could we ask um, v Dot to send us that information so that I can, I will make it, whatever they send, I'll make available to, to the entire committee. Yeah. For, yeah, they, I, I'm chair recognizes. Uh, and just as a follow up, what is the cost of the implementation of this uh, program? Um, I believe this certain area is about $11 million with most of the cost really being in the utilities that need to be run to uh, operate these signs. So not, not to, just to ask a follow-up question for Dave there. So we just, we made a decision to move forward on spending $11 million. There had been some level of analysis or something that got us to the decision point to spend money. And I think ultimately that's what Dave is asking for. What information did you use to make the decision to spend $11 million? And again, I will need to talk to our traffic engineering group uh, to see what information they have. They're the ones leading this project. Right. I, I think we understand. If you could get that to us, that level of data to help to make that decision, that would be helpful for us. Okay, we will do. Okay, thank you, Ms. Parker. Can you uh, provide that prior to our next meeting or so we can have it at the next meeting? I will try. Thank you very much, ma'am. Right. Any other questions about the uh, variable speed limits today? All right. Thank you. Next item on the agenda is the U.S. Census Bureau update, and uh, this is an action item. Thank you, Mr. Yes, the, the letter is the action item. Um, 
we showed you a presentation last time and the staff came to me and said they would like to at least have the opportunity to map and model what we think the implications are going to be. So we're going to do a presentation now and show you what we've been able to find with the research that we've done in the last month. So if I can have the next slide, please. This you've seen before, the red and green dots show you what's good or bad. Next slide. Um, this one we changed because of our mapping. Last time I said this wasn't going to impact us, I didn't think that much. That when you do the mapping and the modeling, we are changing that from a green dot to a red dot because we think it is going to have an impact and we'll show you why in a minute. So it's the same slide. I've just changed the green dot to a red dot because it's a warning. I think this is not going to be good for cancer. Next one. Um, you've seen this as well. The jumps and the hops, it's bad for us. I'll probably have to port next one. And they're not going to include the low density territory within and an high density area. I've shown you that before. That's a red dot. Next slide. This one I've also shown you before. It's the example that they showed on DC where they're going to ship some of the Baltimore urban area to be part of the DC urban area. It's not good. We wonder about how the impact is going to be on the southern end of DC, which affects Tampa. The DC urbanized area. Next slide. So now staff did some additional work, a whole month of work. We completed the project to estimate what the 2020 urban area population would be with these projected census bureau changes. The next points explain that it's difficult to do because the census hasn't released their data. They're asking us to give them our opinion before they've given us the data of the 2020 census, which makes it difficult. We've, uh, we've estimated the urban area at 2019 housing block levels because we that's the only one we've got. It's the latest thing that we can do. The 2019 housing data units are not available at the block level. Data on 2010 housing units was we increased it to 2019 using the block group growth rates. These are all technical things. This is how we model it. This is how we came to the to the model. And we used 2010 block geographies. Because the 2020 ones are hidden from us. The Census Bureau hasn't released them yet. So that's just an explanation of we had to do some estimation. Okay. And that's the proviso. Everything we're going to show you from now on is an estimation. So it's not going to be 100% accurate because we can't get the data because they won't release it until later in the year. So we use those 2019 housing units data and further steps outlined by the US Census Bureau. Matthew, could you take over from here and walk us through the rest of the slides? Yes, I can. Thank you, Ian, and good evening, everyone. Um, so this slide shown in the map on the right are the outcomes of our analysis. And again, I'll reiterate, this is an estimate, and it will not look exactly like this when the census releases um, whatever they release next year. So shown in blue are what the proposed criteria could look like for the 2020 urban area, and shown in pink are the existing 2010 urban area. You will see the Fredericksburg urban area in the bottom center of the map with the city of Fredericksburg and surrounding areas in Spotsylvania and Stafford counties. And you'll see North Stafford urban area, part of the larger Washington, D.C., Virginia, Maryland urban area in the top center of the map. Based on our analysis, the proposed changes to the urban area criteria likely mean less total area outlined as urban and less populated, less population outlined as urban as well. So it's decrease there. in both of those factors. That's all there for one second. So this is the key point, people. The pink was what you had, and the blue is what you're going to be left with. That's the point. If we are right, and, and it's an excellent. Ariel? Yep. Next slide. So as well as that analysis, alongside that, shown in the map on the right are the outcomes for looking at the North Stafford urban area. So one of the things that Ian mentioned in his earlier presentation. Um, so really showing the connection between the North Stafford urban area and Prince William County, which is the Washington, D.C., Virginia, Maryland urban area. So currently, the North Stafford urban area is connected to that. However, it very well could change for the 2020 census. However, based on our analysis, it will change. It's still likely to connect and be within the new 1.5 mile jump criteria. It would be 1.38 miles. However, as Ian mentioned and emphasized earlier, 
this is all an estimate. And one of the items we don't have are the block geographies. So we don't have the 2020 geographies that will be drawn based on kind of new development patterns and whatnot for this area. So if those geographies were to change by point, uh, point 0.12 of a mile, um, we could see a change in, in what our analysis shows basically the connection or the, the severing of this connection. Again, so that's crucial. Sorry, let me. Go ahead. That's the crucial point for Stafford and for Pampa. You see that gap between the two areas of pink? The north pink area is DC's urbanized area. The south pink one is Stafford. They no longer join. But because the gap is less than 1.5 miles, we think it's okay because 1.5 miles, they're still bridged. But it's an estimate. So if we're slightly off on what they're going to give us when they give us the data, that could snap. Now, our modeling suggests it's going to remain because that gap is smaller than 1.5 miles. So we think it's going to remain, and the TMA in FAMPA region will stay connected to the DC uh, urbanized area. We think the urbanized area of Stanford and DC will remain connected because their new criteria say that if the gap is is less than 1.5 miles, they will still join them. But it's an estimate. Matt, show me. Does the uh, census data ignore the population that lives on base in that scenario? The population is counted per block. So it, it doesn't ignore any population, so but each block has to be above the threshold to be included in the pink. So if the block in between has got less than that many units per square mile or per whatever it is, Matt, you can best explain it. Yeah, um, just to reemphasize again, we're looking at one of the proposed changes was using housing units. So housing unit density per um, block. So I believe it was 385 housing unit density per square mile or so per block. So what you're looking at here are shown in pink are the blocks that are above that density. Um, however, those kind of what I've drawn here, those two that Adam actually just circled are just above the threshold and very well based on how we summarized our analysis um, could not be urban. So that's why I draw the blue line um, just slightly lower. So that blue line is representing the distance between the two. Quick question. Yeah. Uh, so you, you said housing units. So at no point are commercial properties, how are they determining, I guess, I mean, like, I'm, I'm thinking even like in downtown DC, you're going to have blocks that are just exactly. office buildings. So is it is it right downtown DC, not an urban area anymore? So there's a couple of uh, processes, processes that are used to delay urban areas. Um, the Census Bureau released um, for their proposed criteria, um, kind of how they go about determining the urban area. Um, and that is uh, the Federal Registrar U.S. Census Urban Area Proposed Criteria Changes. Um, and it basically delineates the first step being the housing unit density. Um, and then the second or third or fourth step is looking at impervious service criteria. So using a uh, data set um, from remote sensing satellite analysis to determine the land area that is 20% or 30% impervious uh, per block. And those blocks that have a high enough impervious ratio are determined to be urban and included. So hopefully that helps to answer your question. So any area that is um, uh, impervious, uh, roadways or a, a grayer color buildings will still be considered urban if that block has a high enough density of that. So downtown DC, of course, does. Um, there are places in our region that, that have that uh, criteria. So you'll see if, if we had shown a map of just housing unit density, and then we overlaid that with impervious service criteria. You'll see where we added the impervious services to our analysis. Okay, so then just to drive it home, like Central Park would exactly would count because it'd be an impervious service. Exactly. Yeah. Um, for instance, Four Mile Fork area in Spotsylvania County, uh, Route One and Route Two Hundred Eight. Um, there is a lot of more industrial-based areas there and businesses, and less housing in some of those places. So those in the original analysis were not considered as housing unit density. But when you added the impervious service criteria, those were considered um, as urban, so they were added. So you'll see in the map here, shown in blue, that area down in um, Spotsylvania County um, is urban. Okay, thank you. Move on. All right, and the last slide here. So lastly, we have data on what, based on our analysis, the proposed criteria could mean. Um, so shown are two tables. The first table is representing the estimated urban area in square miles. Shown is the 2010 values 
different urban areas, as well as the total between the two. This representing the total urban area in the FAMPO region. And shown is the potential 2020 urban area for the Fredericksburg and North Stafford. If the total, in total, if the PERS criteria were to be enacted based on our analysis, we would see a 30 to 40% decrease in total urban area. Um, and then a second table is representing what these numbers could mean in terms of total population in 2019, the most recent data year available. So the 2019 population based on the 2010 urban areas is that first line there. And then the second line is showing the potential 2020 urban area based on the proposed criteria. And then you can basically see that represented in green, that green box there under Fredericksburg and the 2010 UZA is data from the 2019 Census American Community Survey one-year survey to show in the, their estimate population for the Fredericksburg urban area. Um, while shown in yellow there are the population estimates that were adjusted at the block group level because 2019 data at the block level is not available yet. And of course, 2020 census data is not released yet. So, so, so the yellow boxes, there are estimates of what we think the population could be based on block groups and slightly adjusted. And the green there is the more, still an estimate, but more exact number of what the actual Fredericksburg population is. So that 240,000 is around what, based on the current criteria, is the population in our urban area. And then that 180,000 is what the proposed criteria could mean. So we could be looking at a 20 to 30% reduction in our total urban area population. And again, I all know that these numbers are estimates and they were adjusted to account for some of the summarization and data. Um, so that's why you see some of the clean numbers there for 180,000 and so on. And now uh, I'll we'll pass it back off to Ian. Thank you. Thank you. The last concept I just need to explain is this. You can see by those numbers that the urban areas of the Bampo region drop by 20 to 30 percent in number of population so if everybody in the united states after the implementation of these new uh criteria also drops by 25 percent mm -hmm. or the same percentage as we do it shouldn't really affect our funding unless the gap would snap it to the dctma breaks However, if some areas in the United States have a much smaller drop in their official population calculation than we do, they will benefit when the funding calculations get done. If they only drop by 2% and we drop by 25 to 30, we're going to lose out to places like Wilmington where the projected drop is only 2%. So it is important, this, and that's why we've raised it, and that's why the staff have tried it. But what we're saying with these numbers is, this is just an estimate that the staff has created based on the criteria released and we've had to estimate the 2020 numbers and the 2020 block groups because the census bureau has not released them so they're asking for comment before giving you the data to make an analysis and that's the problem with this process so the outcome that we're requesting is this letter which is in your pack which we're asking the chairperson to sign and say we want to be one of those objectives here is our letter and uh, if you're agreeable to the letter, it's been in your pack for the last week, so I'm sure you've seen it. We would like to sign that letter to say to the Census Bureau, we think that this is not good for our area, and we would like them not to implement those criteria. Thank you, Mr. Ross. Any discussion? Do you need a motion? Yeah. Do you have a motion? Thank you. To approve the letter. Oh, I'll make that motion. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Kelly. Motion has been uh, seconded. Uh, is there any additional discussion? Just, just a question. Yes. I mean, at all this time, it looks like North Stafford could end up on, as an island out there all by itself. It's one of the fastest growing areas in the entire region, and it's going to move to the shaft. That's exactly what some of our concerns are. The one concern is that we're going to lose funding if it shrinks and other areas don't shrink as much. And secondly, North Stafford could be cut off from DC. We think it's not going to happen because we're, the gap we see is 1.3 miles and you've got up to 1.5 miles to jump the gap. But if anything in our figures is wrong, it could have a different outcome. So, but you have to, in order to make that connection, you've got to count the housing on the base. 
the year then. We are currently holding on the base, but it's going to be higher than 385 units per one hectare. Like I just told you. And it's built a ton of houses right there along R1. There's a big housing section there. And each block and each block group gets counted depending on the housing density in that block or in that block group. So it's not, it's not a there are houses in the area. It's block by block by block by block. And if enough blocks in a row don't have it because the housing's further away, all that doesn't get counted towards the urban area designation. We're only talking about an urbanized area designation. No one's moving people. Okay, what if we're sending this letter? I'm sorry. We're, yes. we're sending this letter to the Census Bureau. Yes. Should we also copy? All of our legislators, Rob Whitman, Kane, Warner, all those guys, have to let them know where we are. If you look at the bottom of the letter, it says CC state delegates, and we can do federal delegates as well, but, but we are actually intending to do that. Well, I, I, but I, you, think, but, I think this, this the uh, federal would have more impact on the census mm -hmm. than any of our uh, we might have. So we're, we're yeah, having to consider bringing Rob in to talk. To yes, I'm sorry, they may interrupt you. Yeah. But I mean, it's because they they're not going to understand. This, this is what happened to us ten years ago. Was they made changes and whatever, and you don't get a chance. They're already implemented by the time you recognize the impact from what what there's going to be there. Um, and it, I don't know. It, it looks looks pretty bad to me and I don't understand why they're they think they're doing this. What is the do we have any explanation of why they're doing this? So there's a full document, but I, I mean I'm not going to go through the whole thing. The basic point is that two things, two two basic comments from the Census Bureau. The one is that they've got more sophisticated tools now so they can do a more detailed analysis. They don't have to take big areas. They can now do it by a little area at a time. The second thing is that because Everywhere is grown. If the criteria remain the same for 300 years, almost everywhere will be urban if you use the same criteria. So, so, so what they're arguing is eventually we have to up the quota to determine what's urban because otherwise you'll have wall to wall urban from here to the, to the Pacific Ocean. And secondly, they've now got these clever tools where they can cut out all of the lower density areas within your urban area to exclude them to. To keep the urban area smaller, the, the designation of urbanized area smaller. It's highly technical stuff. What you're saying basically is they want to, in a sense, ignore the growth if they can. They, if the growth is not high enough, they don't want to include it as a sort of sort of. I mean, I'm I'm doing the rules and injustice the way I'm summarizing, but that's kind of the thing. So there'll be areas that are in urban areas that'll get more funding than areas like us, where the the traffic is growing at an astronomical rate. I mean, we we have these massive increases and changes, and we're going to be ignored again. Yes, another one of the criteria is whether fifty percent of your road traffic commutes to the urban area, which is DC, and fifty percent of our People do not currently commute to DC, and we don't like that metric. It's a dangerous metric because it could work against you. If we only have forty-one percent, but North—I I don't remember the chart now. But North Stafford, I mean, intuitively, I believe better than fifty percent of the people. Well, the the street light data are not showing that, but it depends how you count, right? So every one of these things that depends. Who's well, doing I mean, the not thing. not during COVID. I mean, obviously, not during COVID, you're not going to see that because they stay home. But you go back to a normal situation. I, I mean, I could go up and down my street and tell you the number of people that are commuting mm -hmm. up north. So I, I mean, I don't know. Okay, whatever. I mean, this, so, okay, so we have, have, a to in, have a motion and a second, and then we had discussion that suggested that we add in our federal counterparts. I'll take that as a Okay, thank you. Do you accept the second Yeah, that's fine. Any additional changes? Okay, thank you. Uh, I'll approve. I'm sorry. Any against? I didn't even ask for this. Okay, all in proof say aye. 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 All opposed? Thank you, sir. All opposed say nay. Any abstentions? 
Chair Rhodes, I move to pass it with the amendment to adding the federal uh, designations. Going back to our original discussion, Mark, this is why we probably want, if you want to make a motion, I'll let you all do it, at least have Ian come back to the next meeting and what the outlines and what the fines the TMA would be. At least start that collecting that information. Yeah. yeah, I think Cindy asked for it to be on the agenda, correct? Yeah. So, that's, so if, that's, if that's clear, you have clear direction. Okay. So, make sure we didn't get a motion to do that. We'll ask the federal highways to help us with the information. You know, you struggle to get ahead. Thank you, Madam Chair. The dog, you keep it pushed down. Thank you, Mr. Dudenhofer, or Supervisor Dudenhofer. Next time on the agenda is to, the letter to the uh, Secretary of Transportation concerning the six year improvement program. Um, Madam Chair, I'm not going to say much about this. You all know I sent you the letter personally and, and I've sent it under my signature and now we sent a slightly modified one to send under the chair's signature and we have no objection. So I'm hoping that you will agree to having the chair sent it. It's basically reflecting the comments the chair made anyway at the thing and it's your policy which you voted on a year ago anyway. So it's just a letter saying, please don't forget this. We want this priority in our area. The I 95. Madam Chair. Yes, Mr. Green. Thank you. Um, so, you know, I, I was not, I don't believe I was on FAMPO when this uh, item was initially discussed. Uh, I just want to say that I, I do have concerns over it because, there, you know, everywhere in America where they expanded the interstate, it's essentially, it looks like equivalent to setting taxpayer dollars on fire. <laughs> I, I hate to be so dramatic about it, but it, it's never improved uh, congestion for more than a short period of time. And I, I feel like we have so many more uh, options uh, for congestion mitigation and, and added lanes have just never done it. And, and so I, I just like to understand a little bit more about what, what went into this because it, it, it doesn't seem like it fits the research and the best practices that we've seen from cities across America. I made a motion to approve. Does anybody want to second it? Second. All right. Now we can either discuss it. So I have a motion uh, to approve from a Supervisor Panouche as well as a second from Supervisor McLaughlin. Any additional discussion? Yeah. You want to, I'll, I'll give a quick. Supervisor, uh, I'm sorry. Mr. You want to give the answer or anyone? The quick and dirty on it is. You've got a situation where you're potentially going to go down from six lanes, even with CD roads, down to three lanes. And the problem is we've modeled it a number of times, and we've had this conversation with VDOT, and I think, I'm not going to try to put words in Marcy's mouth, but even to your point, they agree that you start having significant backup issues still when you're taking six to three. And all we're really asking for is an extension of one of the, the lanes north and south to give it a little bit better merge into uh, flow of traffic, which I don't think anybody would disagree would be a benefit to movement of traffic on the 954. Well, I guess that's in a nutshell unless anybody wants to add anything to that. Ms. Parker, do you want to respond to that? Well, that was a pretty good summary. Um, you know, we don't necessarily think that there's going to be a problem in the beginning. There's enough traffic that cuts off at Route 17 and Route 3, that the volume drops uh, below Route 3. So the merging back in, and we, we lengthened how long it merges, uh, we think will work fine for a while. Um, it, it is curious to note that uh, this did come up, of course, in the FAMPO I-95 corridor study that we did a couple of years ago. And then during the I-95 corridor plan that VDOT had done in 2019, and it is one of the recommended improvements, capital improvements for I-95. Um, they just have not decided to vote on those capital improvements yet. I do believe there'll be a presentation about that at the maybe the June meeting. They're looking how to prioritize all the capital improvements that came out of the I-95 and I-64 studies, and then they'll add them into the six-year plan. But this is one of the recommendations that did come out of the I-95 corridor study is to put a fourth lane between 130 and 126. Thank you. So we have a motion and a second. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Aye. 
Thank you. Any abstentions? Motion passes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Next item on the agenda is item 9D, the RFP for on call consultants update. Mr. Owens. Madam Chair, I've told you this in my previous presentation anyway, so I'm not going to say it all over again. The RFP is, we have to add this DBE um, calculation. We're going to do that, and we hope to proceed with the RFP on the 1st of June, um, assuming that uh, we can clarify that with the with BDOT, but we've already got their um, response. We just need to clarify how to put it in the document and then we're ready to go. So it's just notifying you that there's been a month delay, but we're back on track. Mr. Ross, is there any impact to us? No impact currently. Okay, thank you, sir. All right, next item is item 9E, the smart scale round five update. Mr. Ross again. Okay. Chris Gibson. Thank you. Good evening. So I will be brief. This is the first of many conversations we will have about Smart Skill Round 5 over the next year or so. Um, but we did want to briefly kick this off. So I'm going to talk a little bit about our high level approach and then turn it over to Ian to go through the timeline. Um, but just to kind of fill you all in, we are planning to approach this as a joint GWRC and FAMPO effort. So ultimately, there will be a GWRC list of projects and a FAMPO list of projects. And obviously, there's crossover in those jurisdictions. So we want to make sure that this is really a coordinated effort, that we're streamlining everything as much as possible and limiting duplication. We've also got the FAMPO staff also serving as the transportation staff to the rural localities. Um, so just ultimately, we will be having these conversations all together um, and having joint meetings on this so that we're not, um, you know, duplicating our efforts or having multiple meetings about the same topics. So just wanted to kind of tee that up and then I'll turn it over to Ian to talk about kind of the specific timeline and approach that they've outlined. Thank you. So we will run the proposals through the tech so that you're all happy it's not going to be done at some mysterious hidden committee. Um, there's a the timeline. VDOT has asked us if we could start earlier the cycle than we normally do. The reason for that is last time there was a bottleneck at the end where they had to do technical analysis of each application before that could be formally submitted and it put their limited staff under huge pressure. Could we please start this a little earlier? We think that's fine. It gives us more time to prepare and our jurisdictions time to prepare the applications. So we've agreed to start earlier. We notified the TAC at their meeting that we're going to start this earlier. Uh, it seems to be well received by all of our jurisdictions. So in May, we've started to just notify everybody that we're starting earlier. In June, we'll ask them to start giving us their suggested uh, projects. Not with all the details, just like we have a project on this road, we think should be put in, that's all. So we're going to start a little earlier so that there isn't a mad rush at the end and there's the projected timeline, which we got us quite happy with. We've run by them as well. So. I don't believe there's any action. Didn't we move it up last time? So this is moving it up from the moving it up that we did last time on four. I, I wasn't around last time, so I can't speak to the dates last time. I'm not sure if any of, if Alex or Paul are online and wish to make a comment, but but we are we are agreeable at the moment to to use this timeline because it just gives time to do all of the stuff needed. It may have been that this was an additional move up from the move up last time. I can't say I wasn't around. You remember that? I mean, we had the free yeah, we, 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 we each, each time we've gone, each time we've gone through this, there's been some changes to the, to the timeline. On it. I think this makes perfect sense. It gives us more time. To get I'm not opposed to it. I'm just, it's, you know, every year we're, you know, we're moving it up again. I mean, before we, long, we're going to be, shift a few times, yeah. you know, we're going to be doing four and five together or something. Like that. <laughs> <laughs> um, Any more discussion on item 9E? Okay, thank you, sir. Uh, we're moving on to the community engagement and equity plan update. Next slide. Um, yes, thanks. So I'm going to give you an overview tonight um, of our draft community engagement and equity plan that is currently out for public comment. Um, staff has worked over the past couple months to develop this document and we've cooperated with some focus group participants who are made up of uh, community members as well as um, 
some of our social service partners and um, officials from our school and things like that to really help refine strategies in this plan. Next slide, please. So the purpose of this plan, um, it satisfies and exceeds the federal requirements to have a Title VI, um, which is non-discrimination and a public participation plan. In the past, we've had those two things separate. It just makes more sense to combine them together. Um, this is also a plan for staff to follow to ensure that all members of the community have an opportunity to meaningfully participate. And for committee members, this is a written policy um, documenting what FAMPO staff should be doing with regards to Title VI and public participation. And it also provides the public with resources on how they can participate and makes our procedures transparent. Next slide, please. Um, what the plan contains, so just a quick overview of the different sections. Um, you'll note in this plan there's an overview that kind of gives brief descriptions of the federal non-discrimination laws and procedures that FAMPO is required to follow. Those include Title VI, limited English proficiency, and environmental justice, just to name a few. Um, the plan also conveys the actions that FAMPO takes to comply with those requirements. The plan also has a section on goals and strategies that staff will use to bring the public into the decision making process. And we've also included a method for staff to develop, document and evaluate um, our outreach efforts. And there's a very small section, as I had mentioned, a, a small guide for the public that explains the importance of their participation and a few different ways they can participate. Next slide. Um, so how is this plan different? If you've been around FAMPO long enough, you'll know that we have currently a Title VI plan and then a separate public participation plan. Um, so this is one master plan. They are combined. However, there are two distinct sections, um, but it made more sense to combine them because the material and subject matter really overlapped. We don't do Title VI work without community engagement and vice versa. Um, again, so there's updated details, uh, outreach strategies in this plan. We've updated our community engagement and equity goals. Um, we've included that new participation guide for the public. We've developed a process for evaluating the effectiveness of our outreach strategies. And we've also um, added in the plan a process to plan our outreach efforts. One thing that I will call your attention to, the last bullet part, point at the bottom, um, we've included a provision in the document that staff can make administrative changes, so these are just small changes, and update data without seeking formal approval. By formal approval, I mean going through a 30-day or 45-day comment period. Um, the language in there does state that we will make sure that the policy committee is aware of the changes that we are proposing, but this will really help us just update documents when VDOT says, oh, we need to update this or that, we can just go ahead and put that in there, get a new signature without having to go through formal approval. Um, just quickly, this slide, um, the bold print requires your attention, so you still have time to review this document. Um, you will not be asked to vote on it until your June 21st meeting. And prior to that, we're going to have BPAC, TAC, and CTAC um, endorse that, and they will provide their feedback to you before you vote. Next slide. Um, these are some items that we are doing for our public uh, comment period efforts. It's a 45-day public comment. We've got flyers at the library, um, live stream Q&A social media ads, um, mass emails. You all should have got that mass email. If not, please check your junk folder and help us spread the word. Um, web page, of course, and um, of course, they'll be able to address the policy committee either tonight they could have or um, at the June committee meeting. Next slide. Um, oh, the census, here comes the census again. So you will notice that in Appendix B, it's is missing maps and data. Um, we've intentionally done that. We wanna use uh, the most recent data. So we're gonna wait uh, until late summer, early fall when the 2020 census data comes out and we'll create um, 
updated maps and data sets to keep in that plan. But importantly, we will not implement this plan, even though you're going to approve it before we get the data. Um, we won't implement it until we have those current maps and data sets filled out and included in the plan. I believe that is the last slide. Any questions? Go ahead, Mr. Kelly. Not a question, Stacey. I just want to say that in the last few months or so, I have been bumping into you on different media sites and social pages, including Fredericksburg Strong Town and a lot of other things, and I've seen a lot on paper and around town, and you've really stepped up the game, and I just really want to pass on my appreciation for all the hard work you're doing on this, because I've, as somebody who's been on this board for a long, long, long time, I've probably seen FAMPO and and what we're up to in, in the paper and social media more than I've ever seen it before. So thank you very much. Well done. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Mike. Any other discussion, comments, questions? Just a quick point. Yes, Ms. This is all said and done. What do we do with the data? How does it help us? Oh, uh, great question. So the purpose of having the census data in the public participation in Title VI plan um, is to help us conduct strategic outreach. Um, so talking about environmental justice groups, we need to proactively reach out to low income and minority populations. Those are what are referred to as environmental justice groups. So we need to know where those populations are concentrated in our region in order to reach out to them. Um, oftentimes we will go to um, certain library locations because we know that that's a place where they might frequent. We can reach them easily there rather than expect them to come to our meetings and meet us here where we are. Does, does so that make that, sense? Uh, yes, but so a follow up to that. So, you know, we do this planning every year. So you have historical data that shows the engagement from those groups and how we can compare our past performance to what you're going to see based on this new initiative. Uh, you mean tracking the, our interactions based on like demographic? Well, yes. Maybe yes. That's what I think we just told you you're going to do. So my question is, are we going to be able to compare this to previous um, engagements to determine whether this is effective or not? Um, that is going to be the goal, and that's a big change in this plan. So VDA and our recent Title VI audit, they do ask us for data on participation, which includes the demographic data, um, how many you know low-income people, how many minority people are you reaching, things like that. That, to my knowledge, has not been tracked in the past. Um, since I've been here, I have started tracking that. We track that every single month, and I'm happy to share our data with you. Um, but that's kind of one of the reasons for changes in this plan is to make sure that we're tracking it, going back and analyzing it so we can see who we're reaching and who we're not. One of the biggest challenges right now is virtual meetings. Um, obviously, we might have people in our meetings and, and we can see that we've had people join our meetings. We don't know who they are. We do have a survey on our website for them to take to self-identify who they are. Yeah, they're pulling it up right now. Um, so that should be included in the packet as well. But virtual um, involvement is really a challenge. So once we get back to in-person outreach, um, we can do a much better job of determining exactly who we're reaching and who we're not. Okay, so yeah, in, in, in the future though, you could share some of that data just so we get you know, the cost effectiveness. Is this the right approach? And are we seeing you know percent increase in the engagements and all that very thing? So, right. So, and yeah, in the future, if you got the month to month data and however you want to share it in the future, just an email to the board occasionally. That'd be great. Yes, and that actually there is language in yeah, the plan that, that really requires that as well. So it's I think I'm well, lost your so, audio. So the, the only other comment I was going to make is for certain, funding. Oh. for certain funding applications, we have to indicate whether this particular roadway or transit system or whatever goes through a community that serves low income communities or whatever else. So we need that data for funding applications. So that's the other reason. I understand this mandate. Any other comments or questions? All right. Thank you very much. Let's move on to the next item, which is a very important question and discussion about the highway infrastructure program planning for FY22. This is an action item for Yes, Madam Chair. So this is um, funding, which you'll remember we lost $2.7 million in funding from CMAC and RSTP. So we received 
uh, notification that additional amounts of funding were going to be uh, made available to our region. One of those is this highway improvement program. And this particular set of funding, we do not have a prioritization methodology to deal with it because it's not a regular funding stream. This is something that happens every so often when the government federally decides that there's money available and they make it available for this. It can be used in the same way as STBG funding, but it's not going to come every year. It comes once every five or seven years or whenever there's funding available. So it's an unusual bonus amount of money. And it doesn't, we don't have a FAMPO prioritization methodology as to how to allocate it. So that's the briefing. We have received those amounts of funding. I don't know whether you can see those lines, 542,000 uh, uh, in the one stream, 78,000 in the other, 19,000 uh, odd dollars. So it's 600 and some odd dollars in total that we have available to allocate. The, the TAC made a recommendation, I think the recommendation came from Spotsylvania, that we use 125,000 of this funding to phase two of the East-West Mobility Study because we have no money we can spend on the roadways. All the other grants that we've got for the East-West Mobility Study are for transit only, and you know we have to answer how we spent it. So there's no money for the roadway portion. And the recommendation was that we spent 125,000 on the East-West Mobility Study roadway portion, and the remaining balance of $515,000, we put it in the line item regionally significant projects which means we're not allocating it to anything. We're, we're parking it for the tech and policy committee to decide in future how they wish to allocate it. So the rest of it is being parked. It's not being allocated to a roadway or a intersection or anything. It's being parked with 515,000. So that is a recommendation from, mm -hmm. from the tech. And in this particular case, it was unanimous. Do you have any questions for Mr. Alex? What's the black How much is this study? Did you get 55,000 for a certain amount of transit for 9,100 we got from the DRPT grant? It has a matching amount, but that's money that we already have. It's not new money. And then there was the 40,000 for the 5307, and that's for transit. This amount would be for the roadways. So if we want to do roadway engineering, like we want to build a new road, or we want to Widen Route 3 or Route 2 or Is this all one going to be one effort? It's one effort in two phases. We're just separating out the transit because we can't spend transit money on other things. It'll be the same contract. It's the same project. It's one big project. That's going to be competed. Yes. So once we've done the RFP and we've got three different um, contractors, so some of this is going to be done in house by staff. Some of it will be, we can't do modeling, so we farm that out to a contractor and engineering for ones we can't do in house, so we farm that out to a contractor. But that will be a full process. We're not, yeah. we're not asking approval for process right now, just for the allocation. Any to, additional questions, Mr. Department? And to park the rest of the funding for Mr. future. No matter, sure, I'll move, I'll move the item. Do you have a second? Second. Thank you. We have a motion and a second. Any additional discussions? All in favor say aye. Aye. Uh, All opposed? Any abstentions? Motion passes. Thank you very much, Mr. Hall. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Next item on our agenda is uh, CMAC and STDG funding. Again, Mr. Allis, item number one are our current allocations. Um, so if we can just explain in a slide deck exactly where we are. So you'll remember we had that reduction in allocations and we had to remove money from the system because $2.7 million reduction we had to account for. So we then had to make allocations and then we were told that there's, you can see the timeline. Staff has had a very difficult time with this because the, the goalpost moved in the last three weeks about, you can see that, can you see all the dates? That's how many times the goalpost moved and we had to try and allocate money. So the Shelton Shop Road improvement application was swapped with Route One from uh, Spotsylvania. I'm sorry, from Sapid uh, submissions because we allowed each um, jurisdiction to have three projects, right? 
DWRs be allocated 53 of seven funding. You know about that. This means 2.2 million was freed up by reallocation by FAMPO. We not provided finalized uh, numbers on the 5th of the month. Also on the 5th, we heard about the highway improvement funds, which you just uh, decided on in the previous item. Then on the 7th, we were notified that this $35,000 in CMAC funding, this is one of those which I mentioned it earlier in the meeting, um, members has to be done today. That line item is there. Um, it's from a closed up project that needs to be programmed to something so that we don't lose it on the 1st of June. Um, then uh, on the 10th, the tank approved the drop allocations that are going to have. Next slide. Uh, these are just the numbers which you uh, which we've had for a while. No adjustments to that. CMAC SDBG allocations. That's exactly what you've seen. Then we removed. Here's how the allocation was done. We removed 2.2 million in CMAC funding from the VRE stations. You know why that is? Because we got the 53 or 7 funding. So we had to take the CMAC funding off that. Then we fund funded Market Street. The policy committee made that decision last year. So we're merely implementing that decision, which you all decided on in September before I arrived. Then we follow the best practice to put a reserve. And the reason for the reserve is that VDOT keeps coming back and saying, oh, now you're going to find another $20,000, another $50,000, another whatever else, because the cost of the project has gone up. So the practice is to put a 5% reserve each year to be able to count, uh, account for these changes which get brought up and then jurisdictions get stuck with that bill otherwise because then they come and say well staff have to pay or whatever so that's why we do that okay. you can see there what the amounts were we then uh, consolidated the allocation time frames and kept the existing projects that were already in the system fully funded despite the budget decreases and then we allocated funds to advance an existing project from Onboard Road to the next phase before adding new projects, that's what the existing policy says, the policy that we've received. Next slide. We then allocated funding to transportation demand management GWRI Connect off the top. Also, that's in the policy. The policy instructs us to do that and it specifies how much and that we have to do that. We allocated the remaining funds based on project scores on the application priority. We asked these jurisdictions to tell us which is your number one project, which is your Second most important project, which is the third most important project. After the TAC approval, VDOT came back with a further adjustment. The 35,000, which I just told you about, plus an 86,000 in previous SUGB funding needs, which need to be allocated. That we also have to do tonight. And the reason why we have to allocate that 86 and 35,000, it's small numbers compared to the rest. But that is because it's left over little bits from previous projects. And if we don't put it on a project, because it's old money, on the 1st of June, VDOT head office has a right to reallocate that to other jurisdictions because we didn't use the money. So that, those two, it's urgent that we allocate those two. Next slide. That's the last slide, Ian. Okay, so that's, that's the process that we followed to make those allocations. All right, the current allocations, um, what you already approved, you have that, you've seen that you, you approved that, there's nothing that the other community see. Um, we then have uh, the scoring, which we've done, and the action item, which there's been some debate about, Madam Chair, before you arrive, is this sheet. And what this sheet does is all of those steps that we've shown you, Plus the two amounts that VDOT came back to us with and said, you need to program these two amounts, otherwise you'll lose them. And um, there was a further drop. Remember the 2.7 million drop? There was a further drop of 7,000. Adam, do you know what the exact number was? 7,000 and, no, 7, and some odd change of FY22 that dropped still further. But then we got six hundred odd thousand dollars back, but not in FY22 in later years. So in other words, they took away this last email, took away another seven thousand, and gave back 
in other financial years, six hundred odd thousand dollars. That six hundred thousand dollars has been parked in uh, FY twenty seven. So the the money that we've got at the last minute from B dot in those later dates that I showed you on that slide, we've just parked. It's not been allocated. So if you look at FY twenty seven, you'll see there is a large amount of money sitting there. Adam, can you just move to there? If you look there, 401,000 and 471,000, that money is unallocated. Because VDOT gave it to us at the last minute, we have not allocated it. And we're not asking for approval to allocate it to anything. It's parked. It's not going to be allocated now because we felt it's inappropriate to suddenly do it at the last minute. And we had to have two tech meetings this month just to deal with this. So we parked the additional 600,000 there. And the hip money, we parked the 500,000 in reasonably significant projects. So when you add that up, the 500, the 401, the 471, you can see there's a lot of money that we are not allocating yet because we, we so the allocations we have made, over which there's been some debate, we followed the process. The money that came later, we just parked it because we didn't want to rush the process. But then we got the further notification that there are these two small amounts that we please need to do something about urgently because we can use them. So that's the state of play right now. That's exactly where we are. And the, the TAC approved this slide without those last two little bits that I've just told you about, with the exception of Pennsylvania who voted against. So the rest of the TAC voted in favor of this slide with those two exceptions, which they didn't know about. The, the 30, 43, 34, and 35, and 86. The 86 and the 35, the tax was not able to allocate because the meeting ended before we got to be able to do that. And VDOT had only told us that literally at the last minute. So we couldn't do that. So we're asking you especially to approve uh, what we would like to do with those two amounts of money. And there is only one project in this current list for which the 35 can go to because it's got to have a very specific local match to save it. So the, the VCR bridge is the only project that we got found in our entire list that would qualify with all the rules. It's got to have a certain kind of local match. And that's the only project that could take that. And the 86K, Adam, can you just so remind us where we allocated that. And again, it's basically a part. We put it on a project and took some money off that project and put it in, I think it's FY27 to just park it. So effectively, all we've done is put it somewhere so that they don't take okay. away from it. And that's what we put this to. Mr. Kelly. Can you, for the, for the tax standpoint, give us specifically what, I mean, as I understand this, because we went through this whole process of trying to come up to something we can all agree to temporarily, and I understand it was a, a, somewhat temporary to keep moving forward and get the CMAC allocations. So this is going by everything that we've agreed to up to this point. What specifically did, did the Spotsman representative have an issue with with regards to voting against this? So it's also sent us a list of, of uh, concerns about items in that list about 15 minutes before the meeting started and we found it quite difficult to deal with in the meeting but we tried to answer the questions and it's 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 a it's a very very detailed list it's very difficult to summarize because each item there's a question mark but shouldn't this item get a score one point five there's a question about the ongoing growth project, for example, whether that project is actually an existing project or is it a new project? And the Spotsylvania members wanted to debate whether it in fact was an existing project. And it has been in our CMAC allocation, it already has funding. So we treated it as an existing project because it already has some funding. Mm -hmm. So there's a debate as to whether that funding, whether that project is in fact a new project. So it's, it's that kind of very, very detailed um, question. It's very detailed. So it's basically a question of wanting to change the funding priorities on projects. Uh, 
Well, yes, change the change the way the funding is allocated. Okay. But there we here, here that. recognizes his so a couple of questions. One, I mean, I, I don't know that questions right or wrong. I don't like the because he has a if we ask a detailed question, that's not a bad thing. Not take the time to answer the other questions. So I think that's part of the frustration with Spotsylvania and why they probably voted against it. And again, our staff is saying we want to defer or table this so we can actually have the time to address those issues right there because there is some question about if we follow the plan prior to the projects like it's initially said. So Paul and said we did not do that, right? So all we're going to do is find out did we follow the process or we did not follow the process. Let's take the extra 30 days, the staffs will get together to make it happen. We can vote on the two critical ones, then we can move forward and everybody's then this should be not a big deal. Because again, as Matt, as you said more than one time, you're bringing this to it for the first time in that discussion and asking us to vote on it. So we're having the discussion. It needs to come back at the next meeting. We can vote on the full package. I'm sure the policy, Mr. Ross, the policy committee can do whatever it wishes. Um, the only comment I would make is that a large number of the questions are about the CMAC SDBG prioritization policy and the interpretation. It's not that we nobody followed the set policy. It's that, for example, the policy doesn't clarify exactly what it means by a new, poly, a, a new project. So we have to make a we have to make an assessment because the policy is silent. So there is a long list of things which are questions where the policy doesn't tell you exactly how to make that decision. It's it's not a great policy, I have to be honest. Well, I mean that's a great point. It, it, right. But it's not going to be run forward into something that we don't agree with. We should fix the policy. Sure, but the policy is not going to be fixed in the next 30 days. Yeah. Well, at least it can be addressed. So with that. So with that being said, I don't know. I I feel like we've seen some of this stuff over the last year. It's not all a total surprise, Um, and I do mean that in the the utmost respect. But I'm wondering. I I totally understand where you're coming from, Supervisor McLaughlin. So I'm wondering if we could maybe move this stuff forward and then maybe put on the next agenda, maybe June, July, to readdress that policy, look at where some of the gaps are now that we've seen it in regards to the implementation process and where some of the holes are, and then look at providing some of those guidance criteria so that we don't have this issue in the future. By far the bulk of the money is part, as you can see in FY27 and in the uh, regionally significant projects because we didn't want to have it headed. The, the rest of the projects, I mean, it's up to the policy committee whether they want to pop those as well, that new money as well, and it's <laughs> entirely up to you, but the uh, uh, the policy is not going to get fixed in 30 days if, if you want to fix the policy. And the policy is silent on a number of the questions that are being asked of us. And honestly, we've either followed what was done last time, when it's silent, we follow what was done last time, or we've made a what looked to us a sensible approach to that gap in the policy. Mr. Kelly. Well, just to add, I, I, I think we most of the money is being marked, and that would be the take the discussion. So I agree with you. We, because the projects that are being funded and being done and projects that we, we talked about here, this is not something new coming forward. These are all projects that we've done for a long time. I would have to say it's interesting that the person who has been in charge of putting this policy together in the first place is now the one who's questioning it uh, moving forward, which is a little, and again, talking about timing, dropping something as has happened in the past and said we're trying to get away from just before a meeting to say, well, when I got these questions now, right before the meeting occurs. And and frankly, they're not, I'm not saying they're not legitimate questions, but the fact of the matter is what we're currently allocating is fine. We're holding most of the money back. have conversation to deal with that later on. So I have no problem. I want to make a motion to move forward what we got on the understanding that we are going to review the policy. So before we make a motion, I'm going to yeah. recognize Mr. Wells. Yeah, Mark, I've been trying to talk for a while. Okay. <laughs> well, I, I would just say that since the person asking the questions about policy was the guy who created and maybe he's got some legit, legitimate things, I don't think he asked them right before this meeting. I think they were asked at the tag. And well, I think okay. they said, well, that's we're the policy committee, we're not the TAC. So I don't know how long ago did the TAC meet. I mean, but Matt's kind of bring it up as something that we just asked tonight. He did not. We met twice 
um, in the last month. The last one was about a week ago. Okay, so it's not something that was just brought up, and it's by the guy who developed it. Sorry, I'm sharing it before, right? Is that okay? Yeah, I certainly don't interrupt you. So I would just bring up that, yeah, you're making some good points. Maybe we should work through these questions from the guy that actually is questioning that we're following the policy by the guy that wrote the policy. Good point, man. And uh, well, you're certainly in your sure. kind of yeah, yeah, it's, but, but why not sort those things out? Because the other thing I'm concerned about, and it's been brought up several times, is the precedent that this is setting. Because I've heard you say, this is the way we've always done it. This is the way we've always done it several times. So how about we fix the way we're doing it now? Let's pass the things that are on, on the board that have to be passed. But let's sort this out now and not kick the can down the road. This committee, in my experience, is famous for kicking the can down the road, a.k.a. I think the MOU is so outstanding kicking the can down the road. But anyway, that was so out there. I Thank you, Mr. So. Ross. I would like to recognize Mr. Reed. I, I would like, I think right away, we ought to clear the table of the items that have to be passed. Okay, so I would move that we do extend the recommend and attack recommend on the items for the, the uh, 86, 86 and the 35. We okay. deal with it in a one, one motion. You can do that. We also need to reduce the FY22 allocation by the seven thousand some odd dollars because we are not allowed to have a negative balance. So okay. those can you say seven thousand some odd dollars. Seven thousand some odd dollars. Some odd dollars. In other words, we those move three move items. The three items that are critical, critical that I move that we go ahead and execute based on that. Second. Thank you. Okay. I have a motion and a second. Any additional discussion? Okay. Okay. Um, I have to yeah. Yeah, just question. I mean, I'm trying to figure out where we're going because it. Are we going to have a potential another vote on the rest of it, or yes. are we, okay? Then I'll follow. Yes. Well, okay, potential another vote on. It. Thank you. All in, in favor, say aye. 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 All opposed. Any abstentions? Can we get three? Who proposed and who seconded? So that we can put it here. Second. Proposed by Bruno, but seconded by. Okay, we got that. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. All right. Uh, thank you very much. Motion passes. Let's go on to the additional discussion. Okay. I guess I'm, I don't know how many times, David, we've been over this with the, you know, the technical end of it. Unfortunately for a lot of people, your guy is the one guy that, that can, let's say manipulate, he's probably watching it. Yes. He is. 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 He we will always, we, I can guarantee it, if whatever you guys come up with, there'll probably be recommendations by our staff who feels that they got shorted on. And so that the, the TAC and the staff worked on trying to give the best solution that we can possibly have. And I'm not sure what we accomplished by moving forward. Well, I, I'm just, just saying, by pushing it another arm. I think what I would recommend is that Paul could get with you. Because I don't think the questions that they asked or were answered, whether they're detailed, like I think Tim was brought up before, or and, and, and detail is, is good, right? So, and, it, and give them a month to work it out. And if they can't, then let's just pass it. But if, if we could at least get to the bottom of what that issue is, I think it'd be worthwhile. Okay. Is there any issue with delaying a month? But technically, you know, are, there, are we missing something? Is there something we're not going to do so, based on that? So technically, what we have to do is do one of two things. You either have to approve the list in your pack, or we still have to have an approved list for VDOT. So but, but on the, 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 the now, no, I don't know what the exact date is. So, so VDOT needs, needs this approved but, tonight. Yes. But what you can do, I'm, I'm just going to be honest, I have no dog in this fight, right? It's not my money, it doesn't have to my road, so I have no dog in this fight. Where so, do you live? So, yeah. 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 So, <laughs> we need full disclosure. So I'm going to, on purpose, buy a house outside of Bambo. <laughs> <laughs> but let me tell you this, you have two options. You either do that, group one, or you take the new money that was allocated for FY27, well, for the new, the new term, which we allocated to those three projects, I think it's three projects, and you push it into, and it was an FY27, 
Yes, the balance entry. Yes, so we either put it, so, so those are your two options. You don't vote on nothing, either push the money to a balance entry so that it's not allocated to Onville Road and the amount of the bus or et cetera, or you allocate the one that's there because that will be the same thing, right? So instead of the allocation to the projects, which Pennsylvania isn't happy with, you push it into a balanced entry or you decide to approve it as is. So if you put it in a balanced entry, it means we're not allocating any to the projects. It's piling it up in a balanced entry so that whatever needs to happen needs to happen. Yeah, I guess it's huge to Mark, but I can stress a little more. Staff, okay. What is being asked is a policy decision. Again, we went through this recently to get to where we are in these allocations on the projects, which we've been talking about for a lot of years. My question would be, to your point, is what's the end game? Because staff has already said it's going to be months before they're going to be able to answer and come up. And I think staff wants to work up with a more tight policy on CMAC. But why do we want to hold up these projects for months, if that's the object of what we want to do here to get answers to these questions, why not just allocate these funds now on the understanding that staff is going to have to work on these questions because we've still got a huge pot of money we haven't allocated yet. And we can allocate it under the new policy, whatever that may be, with a bigger chunk of money. But now we're talking about pushing all our projects over to answer these questions. So just two, two things, one quick. At the beginning meeting, there was only two critical projects. And all of a sudden, the entire list is critical. It must be passed in us. Uh, no. So the 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 all that we're saying is, if you don't want to pass that list, that's fine. Just put the money that was going to be put to those projects in FY27, so that we have an approved list to get rid of. So it's not you put the money into the list tonight. Well, not tonight, but maybe they need the list. Um, Susan, are you online? I am online. Um, I need it finalized by May 28th. Sorry? I'm gonna need it finalized by May 28th. I have to have everything completed by June 4th. And then they, they central office starts the QAQC um, on June 4th. They'll pull it on June 18th for the CTB. And then the CTB meeting will approve it on June 23rd. Also taking consideration, y'all also have the 5307 funds. So that needs to be approved. So I can start working with DRPT, advising them that 50, the CMAC funds are coming off those projects and 5307 funds are going on those projects. So that's also something that I have to work through this whole entire process. Yes, so I understand where you're coming from, but were you on this call when we discussed that there were only two critical issues at the beginning of this meeting? They were time sensitive? Yes, sir, I was. Well, you know, in the future, I would ask you to say, Madam Chair, uh, there's more than just that. We need this too. And so we could have that up front instead of at this time of week. Would that make sense? Yes, sir. I'll be more than happy to do that for you. We don't have control over what the guy does. So, in this case, I'm going to make the motion that we accept the list that it is. But that we also we go back and address the issue that Paul's come up with, and see if they if there's any ramifications or, or legitimate issues. I'm not saying they're not or are can. I did. I know Paul has has kind of a technical. I can tell you, my staff believes that we should go forward with this list. Okay, so that that is my. So, with that a point of order, shouldn't we have to reset our previous order? No, we don't have to. We can just go forward. Okay, thank you. You have right. input. So, no. so okay. on this, and again, I guess my frustration is that this was there's a question, at least from our staff, about the process. You know, we don't we believe that the policy's jacked up, right? Not a problem. There. We're not going to take the time to go back and evaluate why or what we missed in this thing. Probably more concern is that. All of a sudden, we found it tonight. Tonight, the first time we saw this list together, it must be passed tonight, or the world's going to end. We shouldn't be running a board like that. That's how stuff gets screwed up, and that's how you end up wasting money. And that's you know, as we move forward with this, and it's not a great deal of money. 
but it sets a precedent. If we're going to act like this in the future when there's more money and real money applied to it, we're going to make more mistakes. And other people are going to get shortchanged in the outset. I understand. We have a motion on the floor. Do we have a second? A second. 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 Just a clarification, Tim. I mean, I, I understand what you're saying. Matt's made those same comments in the past. It seems to kind of ebb and flow back and forth on how this all works. I'd say that we need to be conscious and, and do our best not to do those kinds of things. And, uh, but at this point, I think the time sensitivity is that passes. And, but, I, but I'm willing that I, I don't know the technical end of it. And I could, you know, I'd have to put Jason with Paul and they are, and the guy from the city and they work out where this is. But I can tell you right now, our guys are saying no. So, I just want to we'll ask anybody who's listening or here to correct me if I'm incorrect. One, these are not the first time we've seen these projects. We can't bring these projects forward unless they're in our long range plan. That's one. Two, all the jurisdictions were specifically asked at the staff level to bring their top projects forward. So these projects came from staff, staff from your staff from our staff. So to kind of imply that somehow this is something new and different that just totally caught us off guard is not quite correct. Well, I, I think the packaging of it is what they're saying. And, and the, sen the sensitivity of the timeline is what they're talking about. So I, I don't think it's helpful to, Matt, to get into that back and forth at this point, OK? So my motion stands. I call the question. Thank you. Uh, having uh, called the question, all who approve say aye. 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 Any nays? No. Okay. We're still doing ayes. <laughs> Those are two ayes. The nay is Mr. McLaughlin. All right. Yeah, we're Any, recording that. Any abstentions? Motion passes. I did want to make a comment that, that uh, on the agenda, you'll notice that I changed it before I realized I was going to be late to have uh, the chairman comments. And that was specifically what I was going to talk about about the last minute changes that are coming to us and how, how dramatic it is for us all to have to respond. And uh, I'm dismayed by that, but I also recognize that some of this we we don't we have to react to and it's our policies and our processes don't do it. I did want to also put on the record that we did make a comment that we would like to still go back and look at the, the, uh, the comments that were made and reconcile those between the three jurisdictions. Chair, if I can just make two points. The first one is that um, the BDOT numbers, you saw the dates there, they changed at the last minute for us. So it wasn't yes. staff that was doing this at the last minute. We got those emails on those dates. We can show you the emails. We got them very late and we were told, yeah, you have changed. So, so, and that wasn't even the district office. I think, you know, Richmond. So it, it, it's not us that has put you under pressure. Okay. Believe me, I can show you the emails. The second thing is, I think we acknowledge as staff as well that we're in a difficult spot because while the LRTP prioritization methodology we helped design and it's a good one and it's in your pack, it, it's, it's got a lot of detail. The CMAT one is very old and it has got holes you can drive a bus. Yes. In. So I can't answer some of the questions that are being asked because the policy says a big fat zero about how to define what is a new project, for example. I can't define it for you because the policy doesn't tell me. So I need to put on the agenda when we can, when we can, because we can't do everything at once with six staff, but we need to put on the agenda reviewing the CMAC policy because it has these big, big holes and we can't answer the questions, some of them that are being asked of us because the policy is completely silent, which means you either fall back on last year's process, however flawed that is, or you, try to use your common sense and go what did they mean by this you know it's like interpreting a religious bible you have to try and guess what did the guy mean you know you it's difficult i'll be honest my staff i think have tried very really hard um but there's some gray areas in that policy it's not a good policy it's very old okay thank you mr Paul. Uh, yes mr i want to acknowledge what david said i mean i i was under the impression that the first of this meeting we had Two items have to I apologize. That's my mistake. Um, BDOT corrected me that actually we also have to have a 
complete list approved. Whether we push the money out into the future, as I proposed, as the alternative, or whether you accept that one, that was your decision. But but we did have to have a completed list, and I should have made that clear. That's that that one. I'll take responsibility for. That's my mistake. I can clear about that. I think dangerous and close to deferring it. So that would have been a disaster. Well, I did bring it back to you and yeah, say yeah. no, we do need to. So I apologize for that one. That was my error. Right. Okay. But you can see there's some contentious issues here that have a, a very long training on them. That you need to be a little more, a little more careful. And, and I do agree with those who say that the policy needs to be fixed. I agree with that completely. It's it's really difficult to interpret it. Thank you very much. Uh, moving on to item H four, resolution twenty one twenty nine. On again, uh, this is six to seventeen thousand dollars for CMAC to the least commuter uh, parking places project. It's an action item. Uh, this is, again is um, a historical project that's grandfathered in, so we get it at a better rate. I think I can't remember the details. Adam, do you want to just give us the details on that? Sure, I'm happy to. The um... So this goes back to 2009. This is a project that's been in the area for a long time. Um, we're able to use CMAC funds to lease spaces, which is the most cost-effective way of leasing spaces in the region. So we don't have to build a new commuter lot, you know, each time we need spaces. So this allocates the 17,000 that's been slated for FY22 into the budget for this program. And you can see the locations at where those parking spaces are. Yeah, and I have some questions after this. Has anyone driven by any of the commuter lots lately? Even with coming out of COVID and whatever, I can tell you this, the commuter lot that Stafford County put an extra four or five million dollars in to add another several hundred parking places to it is at best less than it, it's less than half full every day or, or whatever. So my question would be, is it wise for us to allocate money to these parking places when we have significant empty spaces um, that, are, that are existing now that we've already paid. I mean, this isn't a lot of money. I believe that tech recommended this because it is one that's grandfathered in for some reason. Adam, could you just explain that? This is something that's been around for a long time. Obviously, we know that there's going to be a lot of Sure, this this is not something that we could, as far as my understanding, we could not choose to do this again. This is something that is because it's continuous since before the policy change by FHWA in 2009, we're allowed to do it. It's a small amount of money in the big picture of what it costs for, you know, improving the commute in our region. So we, we do believe that this is vitally important, despite the fact that we're still in COVID-19. So we can't, do, we will not get these places back for this amount of money if we can't do So, manager. So a question I brought this up pretty much every year. And in the past, you've given us the uh, uh, usage rates that you give us, tell us that you know there's 80% occupancy, see these, these commuter spaces or whatever. I think these are commercial lots that you're renting at whatever the price may be. But my frustration all along is that we're, we're again, part of the free ride. People that are using a lot and getting a computer ban, commuter ban, and they're getting a government subsidy, whether it's from federal government, or potentially from their employer, but most federal government employees use a van, get the percent. And what we're doing is we're subsidizing their parking space on top of their subsidized ride. And again, I, I don't think we should be doing that, particularly after we built all these other commuter lots out there. And as Mr. Dunap was saying, a lot of them are empty at this point. And I do understand if you're going to say that one of these lots are out in more rural areas as well. You know, that's what the competition is about. But yet, $17,000 here, $30,000 there, $50,000 there. Again, real money, taxpayer money, not going to infrastructure, going to help somebody out, probably making a fairly good wage on a government job. Well, I don't care. Question is how long? Seventeen thousand. How long does that buy us? I think it's FY twenty two. That's a year. It's an annual. Is it an annual? I think it's annual. It's yes, it's a lot. Just an annual. So it would start on July the first. It would be a fiscal year like that. Go ahead. Oh, yeah. Just to, to remind everybody, originally this number was a lot higher because we had this discussion before, and we asked staff to go back and check the lots, and we we basically cut the allocation in half to get it to where we're at now. What I've asked in the past as well, why don't we sell a pay 
that people can buy for the offset the cost and they can hang in their window and they can park in that place for free. Madam Chair. Well, all right, thank, thank you. I mean, look, yes, it's a, it's a small amount of money, but is it real money? Yes, but to Mr. McLaughlin's point, I, you know, I believe one, this is an insurance policy for post COVID. Uh, number two is while it may look like an individual subsidy in your eyes, I will also believe that it reduces the amount of wear and tear by reducing the number of vehicles on 95, which can in, end up actually being cost effective in that regard. And furthermore, it does provide more incentive to get people out of their private vehicles and into, you know, transit or ride share, which can end up reducing everyone's time spent on 95. So I, I do think that there are benefits to the population at large, even if we have to to do it in this way. So I, I don't necessarily agree that this is just a handout with no benefit whatsoever. I think there are a lot of benefits for a relatively small amount of money. Thank you, Supervisor Um, So I agree with Mr. McLaughlin and I, he brought up a good point. I don't know if everybody heard him, but I was also curious about doing stickers or, you know, I don't know, little tags that you hang from your mirror or even requiring the commuter vans. Because when I drive by them, all I see are the commuter vans sitting there and some of them aren't even in service and they're just taking up spots. Like, why can't they just take them every day home and then bring them back in the morning for the, you know, for the different shifts that they have the commuters. So I, you know, and I've even got driven by during the day and a lot of the commuter vans that aren't full are just sitting there empty, holding up spaces that people could go and park in. So are we then offsetting those commuter vans again by then paying for $17,000 worth of spaces at Food Lion for people who are actually needing to commute? So I support Mr. McLaughlin on this, and I, I don't think I'll be supporting this resolution. Anyway. Madam Chair, do you want to boost a motion to get it going? I'll move 2129. Thank you, sir. I have a motion to move to that second. Not here, not here second. Same locality, second. No, I think so. Yeah, no. second motion. I can talk to my own. I mean, I look at this as like, might be. Do I have a, so I have a question, and really, this is more go back to center because you still have time if you can implement something. But again, the other thing I want to bring up about all these vans, those are businesses. Mm -hmm. The people running the vans are making money. Why don't we charge the van if he has an eight passenger van? Charge them whatever the you know the prorated price is to rent those spaces, so we can actually you know recoup some of the taxpayer money. Because again, business is getting free advertisement from this organization. They're getting free parking, and they're getting making money off the taxpayer. So asking them to give a little back, I don't think it's a whole lot. So I would ask because this motion failed. The staff go back and look at options whether the van pool pay for the stickers or. There's an allocation for or tags for the individual riders by a, a you know a, a monthly pass or something allows them to hang there and park for free because I think it's time for people to take some responsibility. But well, they still need the space, and we'd have to have the space. If well, you have time. Okay. We don't. They don't, need. We don't, they don't need. We don't know what it's going to look like. My husband works for the federal government, and he's not going to go back. They are, and now they're even recruiting people that they've never been able to recruit in their lives from like Florida and Georgia and South Carolina. They're hiring people that were DC based positions and they're saying, you don't have to move here anymore. You can live where you're at. And they're actually saving money because they're paying them a lower salary for the difference in cost of living. So I think we need a year to figure it out. And I agree with Mr. McLaughlin, and I would really like for us to have that on the agenda next meeting. So, I want to say my analogy is like my wife goes and shops, and she said, Well, I was on sale. I said, Well, we don't need it, but I got a good price. Yeah. Yeah. And I would add that not everybody needs to work from home because I mean, most people that I know actually have uh, classified data that they work with, and they have to do it. And I don't it's coming because they're going to buy regional skips. They're going to start doing leases with regional localities to implement skips so people don't have to. I said there's some agencies I know that will not participate. That is a match. We're not that's here or there. Moving on. I don't remember HI. We did we vote on that? We already voted. Okay, so we're just not doing it. It died. Okay. It died. And Mr. Alice is going to put it on the agenda this time for discussion about tags and commuter parking. Uh, I will also the GWI, I think, and the tag 
to come up with proposals. I don't know what those are right now. But, uh, Madam Chair, can I ask a question real quick? Yeah, please, please that. Not um, so this is part of our allocation goes to the state that has to be approved. So we you killed it. So this is, goes out this year, no matter what we do. So if you come back and say, hey, we can do a program, but we still think we need the spaces. Can we, do we can't get this money for this part, this set of parkings again if we if we don't roll it over again this year, because it it's I believe um, I have to correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe that this particular kind of use for this amount of money is not any longer an option. So this is around because it was grandfathered in that we could use uh, CMAC funding at this rate for, for this project. And we were allowed to continue it because it existed under a prior regime. I don't think, am I correct in saying that this option is no longer available if we want to restart it at a year's time? Yeah, then we'd have to do a year, yeah, we couldn't do it on a regular basis, that's right. That is my understanding. I would defer to FHWA and VDOT though. So we're just getting out of the business. Like everything that you see. We ran at Walmart. We just did the Are there any additional discussions on resolution twenty one twenty nine, or we're going to move on? Okay, okay. Let's. The chair said let's move on. So. Okay. Let's move on to item I, the twenty fifty LRPP update. This is also an action item I one. For the project prioritization methodology for LFTP. Yeah, Madam Chair, um, this document is the summary of all the bits that you've been seeing. Okay, so this is the final putting together of the roadway prioritization methodology, the transit prioritization methodology, and TDM, the uh, bike and pair prioritization methodology, how we're going to deal with all the issues around that, and putting it together in one document for you. That's what this is. So we sent this out uh, early this month. We you had a week of it, not just the three day notice we required usually to give. It's been through the TAC, the TAC did unanimously approve it. We're asking for your support. Supervisor, I move for resolution 21-31. Do I have a second? Second. Thank you. I have a motion and a second. Any more discussion? All approve the aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Motion passes. Uh, that's not called 20, I beg your pardon, Chair, that's not called 2131. That's just approving the LRTP prioritization methodology. So yes. I just want to clarify just. No, I think Mark did. I did. Oh, okay. It's just approving the FAMPO L20 project prioritization. There's no resolution. You have to approve the document. So I'm sorry, then I amend my motion. Approve the 2015 long range transportation plan. Second. Second. All opposed say today. Any abstentions? Motion passes again. Thank you. <laughs> now we're going to do the LRTV. I mean, now these next items, Chair, these are all the public hearings. We had the public hearing. We got two comments, we read the comments, they were actually both in favor. So the next items you could go boom, boom, boom through, or we could ask staff to present them. The staff are here, we have the documents, we're ready to roll. But they are all the public hearings on the uh, administrative amendments, which you all know about. I move to approve J, wait, um, yeah, now it's what marks, R21-31. Supervisor Manuch, uh, moves for 2131, do I have a second? second. Any additional discussion? All in fruit say aye. 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 Any nays? Any abstentions? Motion passes. Next item is resolution 21 30. So moved. Thank you. Second. Thank you. Motion is second. All in fruit say I'm sorry. Any discussion? All in fruit say aye. Aye. Any nays? Any abstentions? Motion passes. Next item on the agenda is resolution 2132. So moved. Thank you. The supervisor of a motion. Second. Second. Thank you for a motion. Second. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Any nays? 
Any abstentions? Thank you. Next item on the agenda is FY22 UPWP update. That's resolution 21-33. Oh, just the new work program for the new year, but it's been in your package. It's been yeah. out for public comment. You don't know about it. Do you have a motion for 21? So moved. Thank you. Yeah, okay. yes, uh, yes, please. Do you have a second? A second. Okay, just thank you. Yeah, yeah, Mr. McCoffin. Uh, the Unified Panel Work Supervisor McCoffin, I recognition. Does this have the language that we can go ahead and if you ever see your plan post, so we can actually modify our MOUs, MOAs? Yes. Oh. Yes. Who said yes? Adam. Adam. Because I don't want to go through this ridiculousness again that we can't make an administrative change within our documents. Because some BS. So all of that's covered in this document, correct? Yes, if, sir. If you, want, if you want to possibly amend the document, you've got to have a public. Yeah, we can modify it, our. It should have been included. What he said. Right. Yeah. We back before you got it. Or we, Adam says yes. yes. Okay. Is it for you? He's highlighting that we'll be able to do that. We maintain an update sample committee bylaws as appropriate and with adequate public notice per bylaws requirement. So it's open to any of you change it. All right, okay. thank you very much. All right. Have a motion and a second. Any additional discussion? All approve say aye. 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 Any nays? Any abstention? Motion passes. Correspondence. I believe we have two items of correspondence, or was that covered earlier? I have some good news. Okay. The TPB MOU that I did it through last night. Yay. Yay. We don't have to change it and talk about it ever again. It's done. Well, we will because it would Yeah, well, if 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 the TMA changes, we will, but I'm just saying that it's done. You can cross that off. We don't have to deal with it again. Well, just for the record, Matt has been predicting it's going to change for years and years. <laughs> so we'll see what happens. Yes. Looks like it's going to. It looks like it's going to change, that's for sure. Uh, do we have Hearing none, I'll move on to board member comments. Do we have any board members that wish to make a comment? Or committee members that need to make the comment? Hearing none, I'd like to adjourn the meeting. Our next committee meeting will be June 21st, 2021 at 6 p.m. Thank you all for your participation through this prime time of changes that it's very hard for us to get. And just Madam Chair, point of clarification um, before we all leave. On the 21st, are we all going to be in person? Because I'm pretty sure the governor's declaration of emergencies expired by then. That was my point. That's a good point. Yes, okay. we will be in person. Okay. If, unless something changes and we're allowed to be in person, we're expected to be in person. Okay. All right. Thank, thank you, you All right. Thank you for bringing that up. Thank you, Madam Chair. All right. And thank you, everybody, for.